Um, let me uh, start the session. All right, so hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, second session of the fourth day of IIDF school. My name is uh, Gibshan Tashkan. I'm from Istanbul Technical University, Turkey. I'm also working for the IIDF since, since the last year. Today, uh, we will have Dr. Michel Ronco from University of Valencia, who will make a lecture on explainable artificial intelligence for earth science which has been a very hot uh, research topic nowadays, not only in computer science, but also in remote sensing image analysis. Uh, Dr. Enko, uh, thank you again uh, for accepting the invitation and for your valuable contribution to the school. Okay, thank as, you. Sure. as always we do, we will have two separate sessions, one with theoretical and the one with practical part. During the presentation, you can ask your questions uh, to Dr. Ronko from the chat or you can turn your microphone on on uh, whichever uh, whichever is suitable for for you other than that please don't uh, forget to keep your microphone off during the whole session uh dr ronko this is for you i would like to remind you that uh, especially the questions coming from the chat i will ask you to read them uh first before answering because the chat doesn't appear in the youtube uh, live stream part so before we start, I would like to give some information about our speaker and the summary of the lecture. Uh, my Michel Ronco uh, studied uh, physics at the University of Rome, La Sapienza, where he obtained his uh, PhD in uh, 2019 with a thesis on the phenomenology of quantum gravity approach in astrophysical observations. During the PhD, he was visiting visitor scientist in several research institutions. He also worked as a data scientist in the industry, both in the insurance and in the remote sensing sectors, and applied CNN models for the classification and segmentation of Sentinel-2 images. He is currently a postdoc at the um, Image Processing Labor Laboratory of the University of Valencia with a focus on explainable machine learning methods uh, for a variety of earth science problems ranging from wildfire forecasting to human uh, movements induced by uh, weather hazards. So the title of his talk is Explainable AI for Earth uh, Sciences. Let me give a summary of this talk. Deep learning models are becoming widely adopted in Earth science, even if their decision process remains unknown. This motivated a growing interest in explain explainable artificial intelligence. After reviewing the most popular methods, he will show us how to use XAI to interpret pre-trained models for weather hazard forecasting. So Dr. Ronko, please uh, feel free to manage your uh, lecture as the way you want. Uh, so now the floor is yours if you don't have any question. Okay, perfect. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Gutsen, for the introduction and for inviting me to, to give this lecture at the, at the school. And uh, so I will, uh, I will start um so yeah so we'll uh, talk about the uh, explainable ai and uh, and some applications to earth science uh, as Goldsen said is a very broad research field that uh, is growing a lot over the past uh, uh, few years and um so i will try to give you my perspective on this field which of course it's uh it's, it's just my perspective and my view i want to warn you immediately that it's a very um, active and uh, and um, a large research field. So, and I think one of the differences with respect to to other areas of, uh, of uh, machine learning or computer science in general is that for explainable AI, there is really, uh, as I will try to convey also a little bit during this lecture, there is still no uh, real consensus on on what uh, XAI exactly is and what are the goals of uh, of this research field. That, and for this reason, it, it's also why there are a lot of different um, approaches and views within research this research field. And I will try to present it in a sort of conservative way uh, some of the most uh, popular uh, methods and techniques which have been developed uh, for explaining machine learning uh, models. But um, I think it's important to stress that uh, it's not just this. I mean, what I'm going to present is not, of course, a whole 
uh, it would not cover necessarily the whole research field. And there are different perspectives and ideas on what explainability is and should be. Uh, let's get started. So uh, a brief outline of the of this uh, lesson. First, we will see some motivation for, for why do we need uh, explainable AI and why there is such an interest in, uh, in, um, in explaining machine learning models. And first of all, why do we need to explain that? Because this could be already um, a question that someone might have in the audience. And, uh, and then I will try to, I mean, there are, there are many classifications and kind of taxonomies that appeared in the literature already to try to somehow uh, put some order in this research field. As I already tried to say, um, there is, it's really growing a lot and it's, there is, it's not, I mean, it's, it's not proceeding in a straight line, I would say, but there are a range of different uh, uh, developments and branches of this, uh, of this research field. And so there are many different kind of, uh, of ways to classify it and to split it into, into different areas. And I think one fair classification, one fair, let's say, um, way to, to somehow structure this research field is to divide it into global explanations and local explanations. And we will see later, later on what do we mean by that. And then I will dedicate some time at the very end, once after presenting uh, many of many methods for both local and global explanations, I will spend some time talking about how very recently, this just in the very last couple of years, uh, researchers have been trying to do an effort also to, to find ways to quantitatively evaluate and measure the goodness, let's say, of, uh, of explanations. Uh, we know, of course, that uh, let's say when we have uh, machine learning models, but in general, whatever uh, statistical inference models that uh, we have fitted on a certain data, we have a lot of measures uh, like accuracy to, to know uh, how well the, the model is performing. And something similar is appearing um, very lately also in the field of XAI. So how do we know that an explanation is, uh, is really good? And, uh, and I will discuss a little bit of uh, some of the of the possibilities. Um, yeah, at the end, but actually throughout all the lessons, I will try to to give you also what are, to my perspective, the open issues and questions that uh, that are present in uh, in the field of explainability. And then at the end, we will see a couple of, of applications to towards science and dirt observation. Uh, again, I just. Uh, picked a couple of applications, but uh, there are many, uh, many applications of, uh, of explainable AI to, to earth observation. And so I will also give you references and, and, um, and input. So you can, if you're interested, you can keep exploring it and, and look at uh, the, the applications you're interested in. As you can see already a bit in this, uh, in this cartoon I put in the first slide, uh, this very simple image, um, Explainable AI in some sense, I mean, the first part of the lesson, I will try to find ways to define what explainable AI is, but let's say in a very intuitive and simple way, um, it's a bit the attempt of, uh, of understanding uh, how the, the computer, not the computer in this case, is the, how the machine learning uh, works. And on the other hand, uh, to try, as you can see in the, the right part of this image, so try uh, to transform, let's say, the result of machine learning into something that the human can understand. So why, that's why you can see the, the computer that tries to think as a human. Um, and that's a bit, let's say, a very general and uh, ideas about uh, what explainable AI is. But let's, let's, take, let's take first a look at what is the, the main motivation. So why do we uh, need to what, why, why, where does this research field come from? So why do we need to explain uh, artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is a very broad term, but let's say machine learning models. And many of you maybe already know, but it's good to repeat also because uh, some of you could be uh, completely new to, to the term of XAI. Um, as you know, as, as you have already seen in many lectures, actually, even in this very same school, um, in the case of machine learning or deep learning, we have a huge set of data, whatever the problem we want to solve is, usually it's very high dimensional. And that's why also the model that we're using, especially if we think of deep learning architecture, let's say in computer vision, 
uh, some CNNs or some ResNet, they have uh, thousands or millions of parameters. Uh, that's why in the picture we have this black box. And the point is, okay, we get the results. We can measure the performance of these models. We know how accurate they are. But then it's very hard to understand for us humans um, why this model made a certain prediction, um, both in global terms. And these already anticipate a bit this kind of uh, splitting I've mentioned between global and local. So both in global terms. So what are, let's say, the the global patterns and the the general in, in the whole data set, what are the features and the patterns that the model has extracted and as valuable and is using to make predictions and locally, like let's say I have a specific uh, data sample, I have one input and I want to know for that specific uh, case, why the model and how the model has come up with a, with a certain uh, prediction. So the first problem, as I said, it, it's, it's because these models are very uh, high dimensional and have a lot of parameters, right? Because like also a, a linear regression or simpler parametric models, mm, we could think, okay, we have to interpret also those kind of models. But in general, it's much easier because like we usually have uh, tens or, or 100 parameters at most, but even less usually. And uh, the models that we have, that we deal with usually uh, being, the I'm thinking of the parametric ones, they have been built, let's say, using uh, some a priori knowledge. While in the case of machine learning models, the usual approach is that it's just you have some data set, you have your models, and the models, just as machine learning says, learns uh, by its own the parameters, optimizing a certain loss function. So the first problem is the, the, the dimensionality of these models. The other thing is also, um, I mean, if we think of convolutional neural networks, but also a fully connected neural networks, we know that you know what they are doing is just extracting these representations. So they take the data, and that there are several layers, maybe even just a couple of layers, and uh, and these layers are nothing but uh, different representation, different ways of representing the the data that the models have learned, and are useful to to make a certain prediction. Let's say to classify. Uh, into zero, one, whatever is the, the output that we are interested in. The point is, how can we interpret that these representations? Usually these representations are also relatively high dimensional um, and are not intuitively and are not immediately interpretable. So that's, that's also the problem because otherwise we would just look at these representations that the model is somehow encoding uh, into its architecture and then see, okay, what has the model learned? Let's just have a look at these representations. And actually some of the very first techniques for explaining a neural network and in particular CNNs were about uh, plotting and visualizing um, the representations of the intermediate, uh, the hidden layers, let's say. And this uh, brings us to the second point. So these representations would ideally would need to be uh, understandable by humans. So the goal of explainable AI, as we will see, I think this is one of the goals that has not been reached yet, uh, is to try to, you mean, develop tools to transform these representations, very complicated and very high dimensional that the model has learned into something that as human can understand, like it can be concepts, it can be, summarized or again in some, some mathematical form, but some in some way that we can give a meaning to it. And uh, this is important because like explaining um, deep learning models and so knowing how they come up with certain predictions and, and why they, they are able to solve a given problem is, uh, is a precondition for uh, growing knowledge and, and then taking actions. Like, okay, we can have these models that perform very well on a given task. But first of all, we know that in ma the majority of cases, they do not transfer well on new data. This is a whole problem of generalization and so forth. But even without thinking about that, like in the majority of cases, like especially if we want to understand what is happening and let's say extract some knowledge uh, from the problem that we are studying, it's not sufficient to have, let's say, this, uh, this neural network that has a very high accuracy, but it would be good to have also some understanding of what are the, 
the key features that the model has been able to, to understand from the data in a way that we are able to understand and, that, and why, because then we can take actions and, and perhaps uh, progress in the, in the solution of a, of a problem of interest. So some of the, of the let's say, the, the key points that uh, explainable AI is, uh, is used and is studied for is to increase the trust that we have in the model. Somehow it is connected also to the to the point of causality. I will explain a little. I will say a little bit about it, not too much, but in some sense, of course, um, it would explainably. I uh, I mean, ideally, we would also like to know uh, why the model is making certain predictions. So there is some causal uh, reasoning that as humans are, uh, even without going into the technical details of how causality is defined. We are used to thinking causal terms, so we would like to know why the model is making predictions, as I said, and in general, transfer inf information from, from the problem and from the model to us, and the increase also fairness. I will not talk about much about fairness, but it's also another point which has been uh, underlined in the explainability literature. Let's go on. So I think the first, uh, first problem, the first Thing that we have to understand is first of all what is an explanation because um, that's what I was trying to say at the beginning so uh, there are different views and different uh, also opinions on what exactly an explanation is and it's not so clear I would say and uh, and uh, that's of course complicates this kind of research field because first we have to agree on what an explanation would be we have said why do we need it Okay, we have these complex models, we have tried to try to understand them, but still it's not uh, very well defined what a final explanation could be. Here I just wrote down a uh, possible definition which I've taken from the literature. So it could be an explanation, okay, a, a, a human understandable contents on information which has been obtained by extracting all the relevant information from a machine learning model. So this could be a possible goal of, uh, of explainable AI. It could be a, a definition of explanation. There are, of course, uh, problems again also with this uh, with this definition because, first of all, what is relevant and and how do we extract it? And uh, and this is what we will see in this lesson. So in the end, I would say that most of the research and the literature of explainable AI. Is concerned. I mean, is about uh, finding ways to to extract. I mean, what is the information that the model has learned and is encoded into a deep learning model or a machine learning model? And hopefully, not hopefully. I mean, following certain rules that we will see, uh, the information which is extracted is the most relevant for for the for the problem, according to the model. I think it's still not satisfactory because, like, uh, and, and this is something that we know, the people that are that have some experience with teaching, either at the university or school, whatever, like, it's very important who is the explanation for. Like, the explanation cannot be the same for for all types of of people and 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 users if we think in let's say machine learning terms. So that's like again, uh, it's another element and and uh, of let's say. The, of, complica of complication of complexity of uh, of um, for this field of explainable AI, because as I said, in general, as I was trying to say also before, um, there is not probably one single explanation which could be good for everyone. So ideally, uh, explainable AI should also try to provide explanations which adapt and are different depending on what is the final uh, user, what is the audience. Uh, to which this explanation is uh, is, um, is is directed. So this is something that I think is still kind of uh, not addressed very well in the, in the in this research field. But we will probably try to say something more about it later. I think it's just a question. I think that we have to bear in mind. And as we will see, most the, most of the, of the explainability methods, many of them are just for the developers themselves. So for us, uh, let's say computer scientists, data scientists that build and train models, 
Then we have this very useful tool. I'm not saying it's not useful at all. It's very important. But I would say that, um, let's say, finding and extracting explanations for the general public or for a given user is still something very challenging and, and uh, much more complicated than what we would see today. Um, here is a sort of uh, wish list of uh, what explainability should be. Some of these things uh, already have been achieved, I would say, by the literature, but others are, are still, uh, still goals that have to be reached. The first one I've noted down is uh, help us identify what could be uh, issues and problems within the model itself. So a sort of debugging tool. And this is something that uh, I think has been uh, shown in, very, in, in several papers and uh, successfully addressed by uh, explainability methods. So by, by using these methods, what, as we can see, what we can do is also, as I said, extracting additional information and know why the model and how the model uh, has done a certain prediction. And in some cases, this, uh, the reason why the model is making a prediction is, can be wrong. And, uh, and so in this way, we can uh, discover and uncover um, problems of the model itself. Um, the other main goal, as I said, is, is to find what are the most important input, input features. Uh, again, uh, what means important and what means the most depending on the method. And uh, I think it's uh, it's not yet at least uh, fully uh, defined in a, in a precise way. But ideally, like uh, in general, we can agree that uh, one of the goals of explainability is to find what are the relevant patterns, as I've already stressed. And uh, as I was saying before, we have uh, in general, uh, it's very useful to think in terms of causal relations. And so one of the things that explainability could do also to help us understand these black, 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 box, black box models are to provide counterfactuals. So given a prediction made by the model, one way to explain uh, why the model has done that given prediction is to provide a counterexample, so a different uh, input for which the model makes a different prediction. So uh, not a random one, there are ways to define which is the best counterfactual, let's say, but somehow give us uh, this way of thinking into contra into opposition and contraposition, which is useful also to, to increase the, the, the transparency of the models. And here it's a bit, the, the, the other point is a bit more complicated, which is how to extract symbolic or somehow sub-symbolic information. And here, I think it's a, it's a much more delicate point, which uh, has not been yet completely achieved. Because like, as I said, like, as, as you know very well, like these models in general are made of, uh, of these multiple hidden layers and several parameters. Um, and uh, as I said before, like one way could be just to look at the representations, but the representations are usually just numbers that we, it's very hard for us to make sense of. So one of the goals of explainability would be to transform somehow these numbers into some more symbolic uh, concept or informations. Like in other fields, that when, when we have equations, for instance, that that is a way uh, to to translate information into symbols in a quantitative way. And so ideally, uh, explainable AI should be able to do something like that as well. And, um, and of course, the, the goal is to make, this is all to make the model more, tra more transparent and understandable. And in some cases, this has been done by simply trying to achieve a simple list of rules, a logical list of rules uh, that the model is somehow using to make a prediction. Of course, this, all this, approaches, I would say later, have some limitations in the sense that a first warning that has to be uh, said is that whatever explainability uh, approach we follow and we use, uh, it will always be somehow, um, let's say, able to extract part of the information that the model is learned, but not all of it. So whatever mo modern approach that we use, uh, will have some limitations in the sense that it's not the full story. Uh, not in, I don't know if I'm clear. And um, yeah, I mean, related to extract symbolic, symbolic information can be in some cases uh, understandable concepts. So uh, for instance, I don't know, in, in the field of uh, 
of face recognition, a uh, very important topic uh, within computer vision. Um, we know that you know, in understandable concepts for recognizing the face could be the mouth, the nose, and so forth. And uh, yeah, going back again to the, the causal relations, ideally one, one other thing that one other explanation that could be given would be to translate or, or extract from the model uh, some cause of reasoning. So let's say we have a certain number of input variables. We would ideally uh, another way of explaining the model would be to to know what is the the, the logic again, but the, better to say in this case the causal chain that the model is using. And finally, the last two points, which I think are still a bit far ahead in the future of this research field, which is how to disco discover new insights. So explainability since helps us understanding what the model has learned ideally would also help us to discover new insights, even new scientific discoveries in some, some cases have been claimed. Uh, and this, I think it's very hard. Uh, probably it's not something that would be uh, achieved in the, in, the, in the forthcoming, not in the near future at least. Um, but I think uh, before that, like uh, once we understand the model, as I was saying before, when I was talking about accumulating knowledge and taking actions, once we understand something, we can also know what to do with it. And, uh, and that's what has been called sometimes actionable XAI. So once we have this explanation, what do we do with them and how well can we build on them to, to take actions, which could be improving the model, which could be um, knowing how to address a related problem and so forth. These are probably uh, a graph uh, which uh, you have already seen. You might have already seen in other other uh, other, other times, uh, which is a bit this trade-off between the accuracy and the explainability of models uh, of different machine learning models. Um, don't take it like as a, it's not, I mean, it's a qualitative plot in the sense that, uh, uh, why? Because like, first of all, because it's generic, it's just to give you a, a view, like the accuracy of the models depends on the on the, on the the problem, on the specific problem. But in general, uh, neural networks, support vector machine, random forest and so forth have a higher performance than, than logistic regression of last or linear regression and so forth, which are in the bottom part of accuracy. But I would say that especially the x-axis, which is the explainability, so how much explainable is a model, um, we don't, I mean, as I, as I was saying before, I will discuss at the end some measures for explainability, but uh, there isn't really just one measure or, or, or even like a, a, a measure for explainability that we all agree on. So it's a bit based on intuitiveness. Like, okay, we know that linear regression or a simple uh, decision tree is quite interpretable. But I, let's say what I was, what I'm trying to say is that it's not a quantitative and uh, graph. It's just to give us this qualitative idea that there are deep learning models or models with a lot of parameters which are very accurate, but very hard to, to understand. And on the other hand, there are models which are um, simpler in terms because they can be uh, they have much less parameters in general and are much more easier to understand and explain how they work and with explainable ai the goal is to push a bit uh, these these models with high accuracy into the the, the top uh, um, right part of this graph where we have both high performance and uh, transparency of the models so that would be, in some sense, the goal of, uh, of explainable AI. Um, feel, free to, feel free to interrupt me uh, whenever during the, the presentation. If you have questions, just put in the chat. I will, I will answer. Like, uh, it doesn't have to be, since we have a lot of time, and the, the, the lesson is very long. I mean, just, just interrupt me and ask questions, no problem. Um, as I was anticipating, um, in some cases, the deep learning models can be very accurate, but they might be right for the wrong reason, so to say. So these a uh, couple of examples. One is taken from, um, from the paper that introduced the line method, which I, which I will discuss later, where there was this, uh, this classifier, this, uh, this, this um, neural network to classify um, Wolf and Askis. 
And uh, we can see that, for instance, uh, the prediction of, uh, of the wolf is based more on the context, on the fact there is no around, rather on the wolf itself. Uh, because what we have is uh, on one side the, the, the image, the input image, and on the other side, a map more or less of what the model is focusing on. And so there are some cases uh, where we have uh, the ASCII, uh, which does no background. And in that case, the model is making the wrong prediction because it's, it's just looking at the snow. And so for the model, that's a, that's a wolf, just because it's found this kind of correlation with the data. And, uh, and is using, let's say, this, this biased information to make a prediction. And so it can be, uh, in some cases, uh, very easily uh, wrong. And on the other hand, on the right, we see a similar uh, phenomenon on a different kind of data. This should be CFAR data. Uh, so we see that, for instance, is classifying the, the boat on the, based on the fact that there is, uh, uh, there is the C uh, at the bottom. So the, the red mask here is a silency map that is underlying what the model is looking at. And in this case, it is looking at the, at the sea rather than the boat itself. And for the horse, for instance, uh, with this silency map, uh, we can see that the model is, uh, is looking uh, not at the horse, but at the bars, for instance. So this is one of the reasons why uh, this is something that has been uh, shown and uh, discovered somehow by researchers by looking at some explainable uh, uh, AI methods in these cases in the form of these maps. And uh, it's very important because it's telling us that the models can be biased and, uh, and can make a very stupid mistake, uh, which we will not be able to, to find and understand just looking at uh, the accuracy, because maybe uh, the model is still performing very well in the sense that in the end, there are few images like that. But still, in some cases, can be very important to uh, to push, let's say, the, the accuracy of the model even on on these just few cases which have been uh, mistakenly classified just because, uh, for instance, the model is using background information as in this case. Um, since uh, this uh, this lesson is also more about uh, explainability for um, for science. Uh, so for, for a scientific application, one one thing we are interested in is, okay, uh, let's say we have these methods for understanding models, then it can be useful to discover new insights. And there is this, uh, this very nice review by Rocher and uh, collaborators uh, on different papers that have addressed this, uh, this point of uh, how can we use uh, machine learning combined with explainable AI uh, for making uh, this call, even discoveries. As I, war as I warned before, I think it's we're a bit far from that. But in principle, uh, like it could be uh, one of the goals of, uh, of explainability. So in this, uh, in this graph, which I painted from the paper, uh, we have this kind of uh, chain where we have input data, our model, and the output. And, um, and explainability, and interpretability uh, can help interpret and understand the outputs. Um, and then ideally, if uh, we are able to, to use these explainable methods to understand outputs that normally we would not understand, or, or let's, say, uh, let's say patterns that we are not uh, already, uh, we don't already know, uh, this will, could lead us to, to have uh, new scientific insights in them. Um, I think it, I mean, the good, the good, um, the good thing of this review, it's more like giving us a perspective of, of the fact that explainable AI is not something that by itself, uh, will solve the problem completely of, of explaining methods and finding, uh, new insights, for instance, but it's rather something, it's rather an additional tool that we have to combine with domain knowledge, with scientific consistency, with, uh, of course, uh, human intervention and knowledge to then make advances and progress. So I think this is very important to take into account. And, uh, and just as deep learning models and uh, machine learning models by themselves are also a tool, uh, explainable AI is uh, like an additional um, tool that we have uh, to, to make uh, advances and learn things. Um, 
Yeah, as I said at the beginning, there are, this research field is very big, uh, very diversified. And so uh, here I just try an attempt of a taxonomy, of a classification. So how to explain a model, uh, what is experimental AI. First of all, there are some kind of post-talk and, and uh, ad hoc, well, let's say, uh, explainable techniques. We will only talk about post-talk. And the first classification is into local or global. So as I already said, local is how do we explain uh, how we um, understand uh, the predictions on, on single instances. And, uh, and the global is instead, uh, what is a global explanation of models? So overall, what the model has learned. And uh, in both cases, we can have model specific or model agnostic methods. So some explainability methods that uh, depend on the specific things of the, on the specific characteristics of the model, uh, the architecture, for instance, of our deep learning models and other methods that instead just need the input, the output and the whatever predictor. Uh, so it doesn't matter what is the, the specific models that have been used and they will give us anyway, an interpretation of an explanation of what the model, um, of why the model is making a prediction. Here, can you already see some of the of the names of these methods? Uh, we will uh, go through some many of them um, in the lecture. Um, so let's start with the global explanation. So global explanation, in some sense, are, are more ambitious in the sense that uh, we have uh, this very complex model uh, with a lot of parameters, and ideally, we would like to understand. What, what the model has learned overall, like over the whole data set. And uh, of course, this can be very complicated because uh, in the end, uh, like ultimately what the model has learned is the model itself. So it's very hard to understand how we extract this information. And let's see what are some of the techniques. So one of the, I would say the, the most popular one, and also one of the oldest, uh, ways of globally interpreting what the model is doing is to uh, compute the what are called partial dependency plots. So F, in this case, is our machine learning model that maps uh, the the input X, uh, the matrix the the matrix X into um, into Y, the target, which could be either a regression or classification problem. Doesn't matter here. Um, so the partial dependency plots, the, the X input can be very high dimensional, can be uh, several variables that we think are, are useful uh, to predict Y. Then we would like to understand, okay, but uh, we do have the, the whole function, but we know that it's very hard to visualize and understand like very high dimensional function. So uh, we could just look at F, but F is hard to interpret. So what we can do instead is to look at one dimensional projection of, of F along the different input dimensions. Um, so let's say we want to understand uh, just one of the dimensions, which is S. And so we want we can approximate F of uh, XS just by taking the expectation value of the function over the remaining variables. This is a procedure which is called marginalization. It's very common in statistics. And what we do is just integrating over the, the variables that we don't want to observe. And, um, and in this way, we, we obtain an approximation of what is the, the function over what, just one of the dimension. And um, just, just to say that, for instance, if the, the function, um, this is a very specific case, can be, um, can be split into the, just the multi multiplication of a, of, a, of a function that depends on X of S and a G function that depends on all the others, XC, XC can be one, can usually it's many other variables. Then uh, if we apply the partial dependency, we indeed get uh, what is the, sorry, what is the, um, we, we indeed obtain a good approximation of what is the function along that dimension because it, in the end the integration of G gives a constant and we get that F is very basically proportional to H, which indeed in this case contain all the information about the excess dimension. Um, just to mention, okay, uh, yeah, I don't have actually, I don't want to go into the details of this, but there is this uh, a recent a recent paper 
which gives a sort of causal interpretation of this uh, formula for partial dependency. In particular, what is shown in this paper is that uh, if uh, the remaining variables x, c, uh, block any common, uh, let's say, causal cause of x, x, s, and y, then if we condition in this way, like we do in the partial dependency on, on x, c, uh, this is a good estimation of what is uh, also the causal effect of, of x, s, and y. And so I think this is, this is interesting. It's something that appeared uh, just, uh, just last year, but uh, it's, a, it's, it's a nice connection between uh, what is done in uh, causality and what is done with partial dependency plots. Um, another way, another natural way of saying, okay, I want to understand uh, what the model has learned. The model, as I said, it can be as in this uh, picture, just a complex neural network. So the, all the model is hard to explain, but we want to know how globally, what globally the model has learned. So a way to do that is to just approximate uh, the model with a, with a simple model, which is more interpretable. If we remember in this uh, plot with accuracy uh, and explainability, we have a lot of models, uh, linear regression, logistic regression, which are in this uh, uh, bottom right part, which are explainable. And so one way would be, okay, I just uh, approximate the model with a decision tree. So I just fit a new decision tree uh, on the model itself. And this is, let's say, approximation of it, and uh, which I can interpret because at the end it's just made as a, as a tree, like as a list of rules. And uh, of course, this can be done. The, the, main, uh, the main problem is that, uh, of course, that the decision tree will, not, will never have the same accuracy of the, of the neural network model. So as the title says, it's just an approximation which has the advantage of giving a very interpretable result, but it's not the model itself. So there are ways, of course, of approximating uh, more or less in a more or less accurate way, but it will still be uh, just uh, an approximation of the model. Uh, another uh, method which is very used, uh, especially once we want, when we want to somehow give a um, a score, let's say, as one of the goals I said at the beginning, one of the things that explainability should help us doing is to find what are the most relevant input features and somehow find the ranking between these features. So um, this can be done by in many ways. And uh, this, the simplest way is to, to use some feature, feature permutation algorithm. What does it mean? Like we have again this F, which is a function of all this. Uh, uh, input D is the, is the dimension, let's say, of the of the input, and um, and e uh, zero here is just the the error that the model is committing. So L could be a penalty, it could be just a, a root mean square error, it could be um, the, the the absolute value or the mean absolute value, whatever. And uh, to estimate what are the which ones of the X are most important. What we can do is just taking permutations of these uh, of these uh, dimensions one by one. So we start with the first x one. We just make random permutations of it. In this way, we destroy uh, the dependence of f uh, on the first dimension, let's say, and we estimate what is the error that is committed by this new model, uh, let's say, where f uh, where x one has been permuted, so has been randomly reshuffled. And then we calculate this feature importance, for instance, taking just the ratio of this uh, uh, error, which has been committed on the permuted on the shuffled uh, dimension minus one. And we do it for all the dimensions. So for each of the dimension, we know what is on average, the error that is produced, the increase in the error, which has produced by uh, reshuffling that specific dimension. And yeah, what we obtain in the end are things like in this plot where the bars can just, uh, can just are just proportional to this um, this uh, ratio of the errors or this normalized uh, you know, this normalized uh, this relative error, and uh, so the idea here, of course, is that uh, the most important variables uh, will uh, will increase more the error when they are uh, shuffled when they are randomly uh, changed, and indeed this gives you uh, gives, this can give us a, a usable information. Uh, very first information about what is most relevant for the model. Um, a much more 
advanced, I would say, um, global expansion, which appeared uh, more recently, um, is explanation by concepts. So, or in this case, test, and the specific name is test with concept attribution vectors. And this has also been used in some some papers within uh, the earth observation domain um, as i said before like um, one way to explain a, a network would be by by means of concepts in the end uh, we understand better things in terms of of uh, symbolic and uh, human understandable uh, concepts so in this case what uh, the the authors have tried have tried to do with this uh, method is to say okay i have a certain problem uh, in this case, it was in particular a classification task of uh, of a data set with uh, different animals, and uh, and one wants to know, okay, how important is a specific concept for making uh, a certain prediction? And uh, okay, in this specific example, it was how important are stripes in classifying a certain number of animals or objects? So if I want to classify a zebra, probably the fact that it has stripes is very important. So. It can be a little bit, uh, can seem a little bit naive as, a, as an approach and not very well defined, but it goes a lot into the direction of uh, of translating, uh, let's say, this very complex information encoded into the network in a very low level way, if you want, because it's uh, it's just that all this uh, hidden representation in terms of numbers and make it into, transform it into something which is much more high level. Uh, which in this case uh, is a concept, the concept of stripes. It could be any kind of concept. So how it is done? Um, here we have uh, just imagine uh, what we show here is just the different, uh, is shown is the different layers of, for instance, of a convolutional neural network. And what is done now on each of these layer, one can train a classifier. So it takes the input of this classifier is the, is the, the activations of the layer itself. And uh, and in this way, the classifiers learns uh, the stripes concept. Let's say uh, so whether there is or not stripes, and uh, and the, the classifier is uh, is the UCL. Uh, L it just refers to the layer uh, to which it is applied, and in this way, one obtains this decision boundary between uh, stripes and no stripes concepts. And then uh, to calculate the TCAP score, one has to compute this. Uh, Basically, what is the how much the the directional derivative uh, of uh, of the activation of a given of the of the last layers, the ones that it used for for classifying, it could be, for instance, the the output of a soft max. If we are doing a, a multi-class classification here, in this case, let's say you have k classes, um, we take this directional derivative of uh, of the of the soft max with respect to uh, the concept. So one is measuring how much, uh, let's say, the, the final activations are aligned with this concept, which has been learned over the different layers. And then the TCAP score is just, uh, let's say, how many, um, how many of these, uh, how, what is the fractions of, uh, of um, or what is the fraction of activations, uh, which gives uh, a positive uh, score uh, S. And this gives a measure somehow of how much, uh, according to this paper, how much the concept has been used uh, to make a certain, a certain prediction. And this, of course, can be uh, easily extended uh, in, in several uh, domains uh, in the remote sensing, for instance, we could ask uh, how much the concept buildings is used to classify artificial surfaces, for instance, just to mention a possible application. Um, this would were just some of the let's say methods for uh, global approximations they, or global explanations of models. They don't uh, it's not an exhaustive in the sense that there are also many more. Uh, just some of uh, some of the methods which I wanted to uh, tell you about. Um, the other part is uh, which I think it's even more rich in the sense that there are even more um, um, methods available is how to interpret and explain a single uh, input. Uh, so a single point, if you want, in a very complex uh, function f, which is the your uh, machine or deep learning models. Um, of course, like this, let's say, the goal of uh, explaining locally uh, 
in one in some sense it's easier in the sense that uh, it's it's in, in principle it could, we could think it's easier to um, to explain uh, why the model has made just a specific prediction rather than trying to explain the whole model as the model as a whole. Um, of course, it has some limitation in the sense that uh, I mean, if I know how the model is behaving well, at a given point, I don't know how, what what is the how the model is behaving in general. Like if you have a complex, um, a very nonlinear function, if you know how how you can approximate it uh, in a vicinity of a given point, it doesn't mean it, you don't know that much about this function itself. So this was just as a warning before entering the local explanation. On the other hand, there are many many more and many uh, possible methods to to interpret models locally, which have been uh, proposed. Um, uh, yeah, this is also somehow uh, explained in this um, global local trade-off, um, which uh, I've taken from this uh, recent paper, uh, which uh, is very nice because it tries to, uh, I, will I will tell you a little bit more about it later, it tries to somehow uh, make a summary and a review of, uh, of uh, different explainability methods, but also trying to compare them and somehow make a classification of them. Um, so let's say on, on the left here, we have global feature selection, attribution, local feature selection, local feature attribution. On the, on the one hand, this global uh, approximation can be very simple. Um, for instance, when we talked before about approximating the model with decision tree or just extracting with feature permutation, a, whole, a, a ranking of all the features, it's very simple by itself, but of course it's a much less detailed summary of what the model is doing. On the other hand, uh, if we go into local, uh, we can have much more information as we will see. Uh, the risk is that we haven't really understood what the model is doing because we have a really restricted and, and local view of what is happening. So one of the most uh, used, um, I would say one of the most used approaches for explaining um, single inputs so or local uh, explanations is, uh, is line. And uh, and Lore also, which is uh, somehow related to it, but Lime is much more uh, used. Is uh, by uh, the name just uh, by the name just means uh, local uh, interpreter model uh, explanations. And um, so what it does is uh, imagine we have this this global model, which is uh, here what you see in the figure on the left. Uh, this complex nonlinear model is just a. Uh, a one two dimensional picture or projection, if you want, of uh, of what could be the decision boundary of the model. So the blue parts is uh, is is uh, are the points which are classified as uh, as zero, and the red points, the red uh, the red set is the points which are classified as one. So as you can see, the the decision boundary between these two classes is very complicated. But then locally, in the vicinity, the proximity of a given point. Uh, we can think of approximating in a in a simple uh, way with the, just with the linear uh, regression, and that's the the, the basic idea of uh, of line. Uh, in particular, what you do is to solve uh, a lasso uh, regression in the, in the vicinity of a, of a given point x, and, uh, and the the function that you optimize is uh, is a penalty function. It could be dependent. It depends on the problem. Uh, first of all, this regression or classification. Uh, G is the is the function that approximate uh, the function that uh, is an approximation of F, uh, which is the the neural network, for instance. And and pi is just a measure of the distance between the points. Because how do we approximate the function log in the vicinity of X? What you would have to do is to find a way to sample points uh, near uh, x, near the point of interest. And uh, and how you define this near depends on the on some distance function, which you need, which is included in pi. And, and then you have a penalty term, which is uh, omega, which could, which uh, typically is, uh, is just a simple uh, lasso regression, L1 regularization, um, so that you have a simple explanation. In the case of, uh, in the case of Lore, uh, I said that it's very similar because uh, uh, basically, the, the, the main idea is the same. So it's just to make a, a linear approximation of the model uh, locally, so close to a single point. 
the, the main difference is that uh, they use a, a genetic algorithm to find what is the optimal neighborhood uh, and then fit the tree on that. So here, what they show these two plots are taken from the original paper on the bottom. So on the left is what you would do just uh, sampling randomly in the vicinity of X, while on the right is where with their algorithm, they are able to approximate much better what the model is, is, uh, is doing, what is the decision boundary uh, in the vicinity of X. And so one, day, one, one thing is to fit the tree on the random sampling, and another thing is to fit it uh, directly on, on, the, on the points sampled uh, in the way they specify. And so it gives a much better approximation. But the idea in general is, uh, is very similar. So it's to, it's to find an approximation with an interpretable model, an interpretable model, uh, but locally. Um, another method I want to discuss is, uh, is sharp or sharpling, um, which I think is probably one of the, of the most uh, used one. And this, this specific method we will also see then in the, in the second part of the, of the lesson in the tutorial, in the, the coding part. Um, it's very, it's much used for many reasons. So first of all, because it's, uh, it's model agnostic, it's to also for line. So it doesn't uh, matter what is the specifics of the model. You can apply it to any kind of, uh, of machine or deep learning models because it doesn't, the specific architecture of the, of the model, it doesn't enter into the formulas. Um, but the other advantage of SHARP is that it's one of the few methods that has uh, a robust theory behind it, and uh, indeed, it's inspired by uh, a very, um, a very old paper by Shapley, uh, which is Nobel Prize actually in economy, uh, for uh, for game theory. So essentially, it it um, it's, it takes inspiration from the idea of how to redistribute uh, the the game of a, of a game, so uh, the, the final victory among the different players. Uh, so what are the, what is the contribution that is, uh, every player has given to, this, uh, to the final success? And how do we optimally um, split and distribute uh, this success among all the players? And so uh, drawing this analogy between players and the features uh, in, a, in a model, uh, some, what has been done by Lundberg and collaborators in the, in the paper, was to find a, a formula for for the teacher ranking um, using uh, the the idea of Shapley. And so um, phi x x uh, x bar here is just the the point the specific point that we want to approximate that we want to explain. F is the original function and G is the approximation. And here phi are the Shapley values. So how they are defined? What do you do is basically uh, computing what is the difference. Uh, in the final outcome, so in the classification score or in a regression uh, um, in output, um, when the function uh, has all the inputs or uh, it doesn't have a specific input. So uh, again, it's, it's uh, not so different from feature permutation. So the idea is to eliminate one of the features and see how it affects uh, the error of the model in this case is just the difference between the outputs with and without a given feature. But the difference is that in this case, what you do is to consider all the possible uh, coalitions, which means um, in, the, in your data, all the possible ways that that given feature can appear in combination with the others. And uh, in this way you obtain, it has been shown that you obtain a much more uh, accurate estimate of what is the importance of the, of the of the various feature. And what you obtain in the end, this, this picture is taken directly from the package, uh, the, sharp, the sharp package, uh, is with respect to the average uh, prediction of the model, uh, how each of the uh, feature is contributing to the, to the outcome uh, at, the, at a given point X. And the advantage with respect to permutation is that in this case, the Shapley values are also uh, telling us what is the sign of each of the features, which means that we know uh, which ones are contributing to higher uh, value uh, of the model and which ones are contributing to a lower value. And this is very important also, especially in classification models where we want to know uh, which features are, let's say, uh, increasing uh, the probability that uh, an instance is uh, 
belonging to one class and which ones instead are pushing towards the other um, the other class. Um, let's enter a bit. This is probably the first one, uh, the first method that we see uh, that is specifically for image data. So for uh, for images which can be either RGB images but can be also um, hyperspectral images as we often have in uh, remote sensing. Um, the, what is the idea? I mean, the, the, the basic idea is uh, it's somehow it's it's similar in many of these methods, which is, okay, I change the input as well, also as we have seen both in permutation uh, test and also in Shapley value. So I, I modify uh, the, input the input of the function and then I see how it changes. The differences are are more on how this is done and what is the how this the what is the procedure for for the for the perturbation and also what is the final uh, how I do I measure then uh, the final uh, the difference let's say and um, one one simple method which is used in images is just occlusion so let's say I have my image my input image and uh, I just set to zero or to an, an average value. Uh, some of the of some of the features, so parts of the image, let's say, and one can do it pixel by pixel. Uh, sometimes it's called occlusion one, or can do it by patches. So I just uh, I hide a five by five patch. That's it's called the occlusion five, just meaning how many uh, features we are uh, eliminating somehow or um, canceling, and then we we measure, let's say, the importance just by the difference in the in the in the outcome fc is just uh, could be again the score for a soft math so what is the score for a given class uh, or even a sigmoid and uh, by taking the difference of the originally the fact the output for the original input and uh, the output um, for the modified input uh, we obtain an estimate of how uh, important is a uh, is a given pixel or a given group of pixels and uh, let's say an advanced uh, modification option or meaningful perturbation is, is, uh, is also called in the paper, uh, which is instead of taking pixel by pixel or by group of pixel uh, and setting them to zero to the average and so forth, uh, it is this, this perturbation is done in a more systematic way by finding what is the minimal set of, uh, of pixels in this case, um, that increase uh, this this difference between the outcome of the original or the original uh, over the original input and the outcome over the perturbed input. Uh, ideally, I want to know what is the group of pixels that is maximizing this this difference because that means that is the group of pixels which is the most important for uh, for making a certain prediction. And in this case, and on the bottom, you can see it uh, for uh, the class for the classification of a of a flute, and uh, the original image, uh, the model has a score of 0.99, so it's very sure that that's a, there is a flute there. And then what you can see is the the image which is obtained with this optimal perturbation method, where the part which is perturbed is instead is indeed as you would expect the part which contains the flute. So you have this learned mask uh, where the, the, the important uh, part of the image is underlined in, uh, in blue colors. Um, and then in the paper, they, they basically, so in this case, what the, the pixels are not being canceled, but there is some noise which has been added, some Gaussian noise. They discuss different ways in which you can uh, perturb um, the, the input features. So this is the first, uh, let's say, uh, somehow, visualization uh, explanation method we will see more of it um, another one of them this is this can be used for images but can be used for uh, for any kind of neural network actually is uh, layer wise the levels propagation uh, this is also very popular and there are many uh, variations of this method which have been uh, discussed over the, the years um, basically, the differences are how you calculate this this relevance. Um, in, in the original paper, so on the left here, uh, this, this figure explains a bit how it, the method works. You have your network and you have a given prediction. So you have the input image and you have your um, 
your convolutional layers with their kernels. And uh, you can imagine that each pixel of the input image follows somehow a flow within this network, a flow which is determined by the activations. Uh, so there are some patterns which are non-existent or, or very weak because the activations there for that input are, are very low or zero. And there are other patterns which instead are very active. And in the end, if you follow this flow, you arrive to the final prediction. Um, the idea of, of layer-wise layer -wise, uh, relevance propagation is to, um, a posteriori, of course, once the, the model has been trained, to find uh, these relevances. So to follow the, this, uh, this, this flow uh, on the opposite direction, so starting from the output and propagating the relevance uh, from one layer to another. Uh, how the, the relevance is defined. So the relevance uh, from uh, a layer of a layer J in, influenced by the previous layer K is just defined by the ratio of Z and J K over Z, Z or K uh, multiplied by R K, where R K is the relevance for the, the preceding, the previous layer. And it's the Z are nothing but the, the, the activations um, multiplied by the weights. So you're basically really just following what the, the network is doing and propagating back these activations. And then what you do is you have to somehow summarize this information. So what you do is, uh, is to sum, uh, to obtain the relevance of a given layer, you summarize, you sum over all these, uh, all the connections that basically arrive from the previous, uh, the previous layer. So if you, as you can see in the image, if you want to, or in the formula, if you want third J, you will calculate all this uh, Rjk and then sum over 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 k, which is the the different neurons in the previous layer. And a good property of this uh, of the layer wise relevant propagation is that you can check that if, if the sum uh, over all the relevances is nothing but the function itself. So in some sense, it's uh, it's not an approximation; it's really just giving what the function is. The point is that then in the end, what you would see is looking at these relevances and, and at, the, at the end, so at the, the image itself, and see uh, what different parts have been outlined and defined by the method. Um, let's, let's discuss now uh, what, are, what are called sometimes gradient-based uh, methods. Um, which are a class in the sense that uh, there are different ways that uh, the gradients, which gradients, derivatives of the of the model with respect to the inputs, have been used uh, to produce uh, explanations or to produce, as it sometimes are called, the saliency um, saliency maps or or scores for the input features. Um, the basic uh, the basic algorithm is just a gradient. So we have our function. Uh, again, if it's a classifier, we might have the, the output for a given class of C of X. And we just take the derivative of this function with respect to the to the to the input features uh, at a given point. Um, and this somehow, if you if you think about it, uh, can give uh, an approximation of what is the importance locally, especially if, imagine if, um, especially in the case that in which you can think that locally the function is uh, can be approximated with a linear function, the derivative would just give you the coefficient of uh, for a given feature. So sometimes, some in some sense, the importance of that features. Of course, the, um, if you think of a neural network, it's much more complex. So it's uh, it will not give you directly this coefficient because it's composed of much, many more parameters. But the, the idea is that the gradient gives you anyway a, a, an estimate um, of what is the the direction of the or what is the decision boundary locally, uh, a good approximation of the decision boundary locally to X. Um, there are, of course, many, as I said before, um, many variations and uh, ad, ad, let's say more advanced version of uh, of gradient methods. And uh, one of them is integrated gradients. Um, here, here is the formula. Uh, let let me introduce it. So why uh, the, the, the why the authors uh, pro of this paper, axiomatic attribution, proposed this method of integrated gradients? So. Imagine as we have here in the 
in this picture at the, on the bottom left, we have our function f, uh, depending on x, okay, this is very simplified, just one dimensional. And then imagine that it's given by this sort of, uh, it's not really a value, but let's say it's, there is this linear, linear part and then it reaches a plateau, it's almost flat. It's actually flat in this, uh, in this plot. So if you want the, to know what is the, the importance uh, in the, of any point, uh, which is after the plateau, and you take the gradient, the gradient will be zero because of course the function is flat. So it will tell you that the importance of that feature is, is zero, but it's not exactly like that because we know that the function in the end instead is uh, it just, just reach some saturation. And these saturation effects are, are present many times in a neural network for, for different reasons. Some of them is that um, because of the nonlinearity functions which are used inside the networks, uh, which are, uh, for instance, can be sigmoids or, or even ReLU functions, we can saturate and so pro produce this kind of saturation and plateau effects. And in those cases, uh, gradients will not be reliable. Um, let's say estimate of the importance. This is the argument, the main argument that they make in this, in this paper to introduce integrated gradients. And so what they propose is instead to say, okay, the importance is not just the gradient at that specific point, but is given somehow by the sum or better to say the integral of all the gradients, all the contributions uh, from that point, from a baseline to that point. So what is shown here in the, in the picture, let's say I want to explain this uh, input image, which is just a dog. I will not take the, the derivatives just uh, uh, of this of the function with respect to this input to explain, let's say the class dog, but instead I will calculate the, the effect um, by uh, approximating, by taking a baseline, which in this case is, uh, is just this, uh, an image with all zeros. So an image with, with, with nothing and uh, make a linear approximation from this baseline to the final input, which I want to explain, and take the integral of the derivatives uh, along all these, uh, all the, let's say, all the images which are, which lay along this uh, straight line. And this gives us a much better uh, estimate, let's say, of what is the importance of this, uh, of, of how much importance that the function, the, the model is giving to this specific input. So Z in the formula here is a baseline, which can be just zero. X is the specific uh, input that we want to explain. Um, and so uh, we take the difference between the input and the baseline and multiply it uh, for, by the integral of the derivative of the function um, by integrating over alpha, which is the parameter that uh, basically uh, approximate, that basically parameterize this line between the baseline and the input. And um, two good properties that this, uh, this method has are the fact that it's uh, implementation invariant, so it does not depend uh, some, some, some sense on the architecture of the model. I would I say in some sense, because all these gradient methods, on the other hand, depend on the model uh, because they require the model to be uh, differentiable uh, on all the axes. Uh, which is true for neural networks, but it's not true in general for all models. And the other uh, axiom or the other property that they satisfy uh, is completeness, which means that the difference uh, between, um, let's say, if you have uh, two points which differ uh, in a given feature, the differences of the outcome of the, the fact of the model in uh, these two points is given by the sum of the integrated gradients uh, Along these two. So let's see. There is a, let's see some of the properties and uh, that these graded based, based methods have. And in particular, there is this, uh, this nice paper uh, by uh, Mark Ancona and others, uh, which tries to somehow make a class classification or compare different graded based methods. Um, and um, and so it tries to somehow find what are similarities and uh, let's say comparisons among these uh, different gradient-based methods. And what they what these are some of the conclusions which are uh, which are found in this uh, this paper, which I think could be useful as general lessons. And uh, they show that all gradient methods have uh, low accuracy in, in finding the sign of the attributions. The sign is what I was 
mentioning before when I was talking about Shapley value. So we ideally we would like to know also uh, in which direction each of the features is influencing the output, meaning that we want to know if it is increasing, let's say, um, the classification score, if we are talking about classification, but even about regression, like if it is increasing or decreasing the output of the model. Uh, so not just a score that tells us how important a feature is. And uh, what they find is also that um, while occlusion techniques, and in particular occlusion one, so pixel by pixel, is good for finding local attribution. So if to find very localized structures, if one or two or three pixels are important, integrated gradients and also uh, layer-wise relevance propagation, which we just discussed, are more important, uh, are, let's say, better to find uh, interactions among features, so more global patterns within uh, a given image, within a given input. Um, they also find that uh, input per gradient, so there is another explainability method, which is just taking the gradient and multiplying it by the input, uh, it's very um, similar to the outcome that one can obtain with occlusion one. So the silence enough that one obtains is very similar in the end. And actually, sometimes this is shown in other paper that is also very similar to integrated gradients, as one might expect. Um, since the difference is just taking the, the, the integral over the whole uh, linear path. And what they find is also that um, Layer a specific version of layer wise relevance propagation is uh, equivalent, is fully equivalent to input times gradient if all the activations of the network are just uh, rectified linear units. And uh, of course, in the end, this might seem trivial, but uh, it's not completely. Uh, all methods are uh, found to be equivalent in the case of linear models. So if I have a model which is just linear, in the end, all these different kind of methods which have been developed and which differ because the models are instead highly nonlinear, gives us the same uh, importance, it's the same scores. Um, I promised I would have said something about uh, causality within the field of explainability. Uh, of course, this is a, is a completely uh, other topic by itself. What I would say is just mention that there are some methods that try to import some idea from causal inference and causality within the field of explainable AI. And uh, in particular, let me briefly discuss this, uh, this method, which appeared in this paper uh, very quite recently, uh, about producing how to produce causal explanations. So uh, what they do in this case, I mean, I think the main, uh, the main difference with respect to, to other methods that we have discussed already, is that, as you can see in this figure, what they do is that they, they use the input to train uh, a given a model, a given predictive model that predicts the target, the output. But then they also train uh, another model, which is instead learning the explanations. And now we'll say uh, in a moment in what sense. So the explanations are learned somehow uh, apart in a, different, uh, in a different network from the same data, of course. Uh, how these explanations are learned and better to say what is the target uh, for these explanations because of course uh, it's very clear what do we mean by the, the target uh, of, a, of a given problem the, 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 the class for a classification so our regression function the ground truth but for the explanations usually we don't have any ground truth so what they do in this paper is to somehow take inspiration from the concept of danger causality and uh, define um, and define the, a distribution for for the explanations how so they calculate so once the, the model has been trained so you have a function f uh, what they calculate is the is the error uh, which is obtained by setting to zero so again perturbing the input and putting to zero or or to a mean or somehow eliminating some of the features and uh, and then they calculate what is the for all the inputs what is the difference between the error when we uh, eliminate let's say some of these features setting them to zero and the original error of the model on that specific instance and then they define this uh, sort of what they call a causal loss which is uh, I just want something which is given by the the average. Uh, 
chaos divergence, the product labeler divergence, divergence between um, between the distribution of this omega. So what is the the, the distribution of the errors uh, when we eliminate some features? And uh, the AI would be the A, which are just the, the explanations produced by the models. So the explanations are uh, produced and learned by minimizing uh, this KL divergence with uh, what is the basically the, the, the variation in the error uh, produced by eliminating some features. And in Okay, I think Rocco is gone uh, due to some due to some technical issues on our internet. So let's wait for a while for him to attend. Probably he'll be back soon. Sorry, Wilson, I'm having some problem with the connection. I fixed it, uh, but uh, maybe it could be a good moment to make a short break. <laughs> yeah, and, okay. Uh, okay. Let's so, come back. Let's come yeah. back in 10 minutes and uh, okay. that will finish the presentation. And then... All right. Okay. Let's have a time right. uh, break, then, then get back together. Okay. Okay. Good. Thanks. Okay. Bye.
Hello. Shell, can you hear me? I actually cannot hear you if I'm not the only one. I can't hear you. No, me neither. Yeah, okay. Oh yeah, we cannot hear you. Maybe you, con you uh, disconnect yourself and try to connect again. All right. So you're back. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Oh, okay, perfect. Sorry again for the inconvenience. I had some problems with the laptop and also with the connection. So uh, I hope everything works fine now. Yeah, it's so, fine. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, okay, so let's let's go back to the to the presentation. Let's start it. Sure. Okay. Uh, Okay, so we were. Okay, so we were talking about um, this method uh, for for finding um, causal uh, somehow defining this way causal feature uh, importances and scores. Uh, as I was explaining before, it was uh, the. The main ingredient is this um, is the fi is finding the explanations. Uh, it's learning actually the explanations through the different models. As you can see in the figure, there is a function that uh, learns the explanations, and somehow the since you don't have really ground truth for the explanations, you construct this uh, this distribution of the of the importances by calculating um, the let's say the the difference in the error when you when you cancel uh, or when you eliminate some of the some of the input features, for instance, setting them to zero in the simplest uh, case, um, and then minimizing uh, the the KL divergence between the two distributions, so distributions of these errors and um, the one of the produced explanations. Uh, the explanations is just a, a vector uh, with the same dimension of the input. One obtains um, one learns somehow the optimal explanations, which are uh, in this sense causally connected to the to the to the output of the model. Um, let's go on, and 
so and discuss uh, another method that somehow uses the, the gradients, uh, but in a different way, uh, which is called uh, gradient class activation mappings. Um, it's a bit different from the others that we have discussed before, uh, because uh, it focuses the gradients is, is uh, used in a different way in the sense that one is not taking derivatives of the outputs with respect to the input, but um, these, uh, these coefficients alpha, alpha kappa, uh, and at the bottom are defined as derivatives of the function uh, with respect to the activations of a given set of layers or a given layer. So as you can see also in this um, in, the, in the figure, uh, you, you take uh, a certain number of feature maps, for instance, all the feature maps uh, which are learned in a, in a given convolutional, uh, convolutional block, and uh, computes uh, these coefficients by uh, taking derivatives of, uh, of the output with respect to the, the activations of each of these layers, and then take a sort of max pooling over, or over the two uh, height and, and the width, so over the two spatial dimensions to define uh, these, uh, these k coefficients uh, as much as the number of layers that you have uh, in the block. And then the, the, the final, uh, let's say, um, Saliency map, so the final uh, explanation and scores are obtained by taking simply a, a linear combination of uh, of the activations of the of the of the layer uh, passed through a ReLU function, so a linear activation function, um, and then what we obtain is uh, something like in this uh, in this uh, in this picture where you have this input image and uh, which in this case is just the X-ray of, um, of a patient, and we obtain a, a sort of uh, maps of the of the most uh, relevant feature. Let's say uh, from a conceptual point of view, uh, from my, from what I think, the, the difference of this method with respect to others is that you are focusing we are focusing um, rather than on the on the input on the importances of the input already on the importances learned by the model in some of the representation. And um, and so it's already a sort of uh, higher level. Um, it's a sort of higher level explanations and scores that you obtain because, uh, as uh, as it is clear from the formula, what you are looking at is not directly uh, derivatives with respect to input dimensions, but derivatives with respect to dimension um, learned in the of the learned representations in some of the layers. And so depending also on which kind of uh, convolutional block you focus on, I mean, ideally you could also take all of them, but actually if you look at the formula, you couldn't because it depends on the, like alpha depends on, on the dimension of the, of the layers of the feature maps. Um, so depending on where you calculate the, the, the grad camp uh, importances in your network, you will obtain a, a more or less uh, coarse uh, importance map. Because let's say that we know uh, from several papers that somehow uh, neural networks tend to learn these hierarchical um, representations. So if we, let's say, apply uh, GradCam to some of the late layers, we will obtain in general a much more uh, coarse and global uh, importance scores. On the other hand, if we apply it to some of the very early layers, it will look very similar to uh, the input image and also very similar to what we obtain with other methods. Because, uh, I mean, if you go very, very close to the input layers in the end, the activations become closer to the input uh, itself. And so the, the formula will be also similar to the to other gradient methods. Um, let's go, let's see uh, what, has been done in this uh, in this paper, which I already mentioned before. This paper by Covert, Lundberg, and Lee um, is an attempt of uh, classifying and uh, unifying different kind of methods. I mean, I presented uh, some of them, but there are actually many more and possible variations of each of these methods depending on 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 several things. For instance, how uh, one modify the input uh, image, so the, the perturbation technique which is used, but also how it is calculated and the, the importance at the end. 
And what they tried, the authors tried to do in this paper is somehow to, to classify uh, several of these methods uh, by looking at three different aspects. So the first one, uh, how the features are eliminated or removed. So if you want how you perturb the input to uh, obtain an important score, uh, and one of the simplest cases we have seen are just setting some of the features to zero. Um, the second thing uh, they use, the second criteria they use to differentiate among different methods is uh, what they explain. So some of them, uh, so the model behavior, some of them focus on the prediction, if, uh, how the prediction changes, some other focus on the prediction loss, as we have already also seen in, uh, in, uh, in some of the slides before, and others instead focus more on the data, the data loss or the expectation value of the, of the loss over the whole data set. And finally, the third criterion that they identify that helps uh, somehow uh, categorizing different methods is how they summarize then the important system the results. Uh, it can be through, for instance, this course of the futures, but it can be done in different ways. And what you see here in, the, in this table is just um, they put together, based on these three criteria, uh, some of the models. So for instance, I don't know, he, he explained the methods we just discussed before about causal explanations is similar to occlusion methods for what regards how the features are removed, because they both uh, remove features by setting them to zero. Uh, but also with respect to how they summarize the results, um, because in the end they, they both look at the difference in the prediction outcome uh, by calculating the difference in the error. Um, and so, if, and so we will see also the other day of the methods that we have discussed, such as Lime, Sharply, and so forth. And um, and what they try to do, I think it's um, it's useful because in the end. Uh, as I said from the beginning, uh, there is really no um, a single and coherent, uh, let's say, um, approach to explainable AI. And so it's very useful since we have a, a bunch of different methods. Uh, it's very use it are very useful these works that try somehow to unify them and see and compare them and see in what sense they are similar or not, because many of them are very small variations of other methods which are already um, in the literature. Um, now I want to jump into another thing which I have uh, already touched briefly at the beginning, which is, okay, uh, the goal, the general goal is to explain deep learning models. And we have seen that um, in many cases, the ex these explanations are nothing but some scores of the input features, either in the, in the form of saliency maps, if the input is an image, or in just directly in the form of uh, a vector of numbers, uh, each number um, corresponding to the importance of, the, of each the dimensions. If we have, uh, let's say, a, a vector as, a, as an input, a one-dimensional vector. Um, but like um, uh, the point is like uh, who like wh what did these explanations ideally? should convey us some additional information and should help us understanding what the model has learned. And for sure, like uh, this uh, visualizing these saliency maps are very useful uh, tools. But at the end, like, how can we be sure that an explanation is correct? Like, um, and this also depends uh, on, on who is the final user. Like, as I was saying before, what who is this explanation for? What is the target, the, the final user that should uh, look at this explanation and, and understand something about uh, what the model has learned thanks to this, uh, this explanation? And so it's also important, important, how can we compare explanations? So I mentioned two papers, the one by Ancona and this other uh, one I just discussed briefly, by, by, which is more recent, by Lundberg, where they try to compare several methods and somehow find similarities and differences among the methods. But once we have, let's say, two saliency maps uh, coming from two different methods uh, for the same input and for the same model, how do we uh, know which one should we favor, like which one is better than the other? And also how reliable is an explanation? So in the end, the point is uh, that we have, uh, or at least until now, we, we have discussed no way uh, to measure uh, the, the quality, the goodness of an explanation. So we are not really able to compare uh, a 
unlock them. And uh, what is typically done, what has been done so far, and and, um, and is still done in many cases, is just to ask experts. So in the end, uh, whatever is the application in, in the case of uh, over science or remote sensing will be some some climate scientists or some expert in remote sensing that would look at the explanations and say, okay, this is correct and this is not. This works. The problem, of course, the risk is uh, is confirmation bias. Like uh, in many cases, uh, we try just to confirmation bias, which is present also in other uh, situations. But in this case, uh, the risk is that um, one looking at an explanation we just um, evaluate it by what we do already expect and what we already know about the problem. So, and it's not just uh, the fact of a bias, so the fact that uh, we might end up favoring just the explanations that confirms what we already expect, but also the fact that in this way, if you remember at, at the beginning, we were talking about uh, using explanations and explainable AI as, as a tool for um, discovering new insights and uh, and even find scientific uh, valuable uh, insights and discoveries of course if we it's a bit of a loop right like if we have deep learning models that potentially learn new things then we use explanations and we evaluate explanations based on what we already know as experts uh, then in the end it's very hard to to see how we can learn new things instead and uh, this is a bit matter for for thoughts and, and um, further work actually. But one way to address these problems is to say, okay, let's see if we can find uh, some quantitative uh, way of uh, establishing whether an explanation is good or not. Uh, besides the the opinion of a, of an expert or a person or a human, which looks at the explanations and tells us which one is better. And um, there is this nice work. Uh, it's one of uh, many others, actually, um, which uh, by Joshua Benjo uh, and others, um, where they basically um, do some some sanity checks on on many uh, explanation methods, some of which we have discussed today already. And basically, the, the two main checks that they do are the first test is to randomize the model parameters. So you have your trained models whose parameter have been optimized, uh, minimizing a certain loss for classifying uh, images, for instance. And then you randomize them. And then you look at the explanations uh, using different methods uh, when the model's parameters have been randomized. So the, the output of the model is completely random. And then you try to explain this random output. And then you compare the explanations obtained on the original model, uh, so the ones that has a good accuracy, uh, and the ones that instead is completely broken because the, the parameters are random. And, um, and this is the figure on the bottom left, where you see the original image of a bird, and then different saliency maps obtained with the gradients, with the uh, gradient times input, uh, with uh, GradCam, which we just discussed, with integrated gradients and so forth. And from left to right, what is done is that uh, there is a cascading randomization of the layers from the top to bottom layers. So the, in the first column, uh, only the, the last layer has been randomized, and then also the, the, the layer be before and so forth, until at the very end, if we look at the last column, basically all the layers in this uh, uh, convolutional model had been uh, randomized. And uh, what they notice is that there are some methods for which the explanation is always the same, or it doesn't really change uh, much when the model is good and uh, has learned something and when the model is completely random. And so, for instance, uh, in, the, in the case of, uh, of um, uh, guided uh, GradCam, which is a variation of, of GradCam, uh, you see that the explanation is basically the same uh, all, over all the all, over all these uh, these random models, and uh, also in the case of uh, gradient times input, it changes but not so much. And uh, if we look also at the integrated gradients, there are some variation, but they are not so relevant. And so they also, of course, propose some some metrics for measuring the similarity among different maps and uh, and quantify it. 
um, while in the case of other methods like I don't know, grad count, for instance, uh, which is the, this, uh, this red science maps in the middle, we can see there, there are some variations when we pass from one to another. And also in gradient, which is the first row, we can see that the gradient change a lot when we have the original model and then the random models. Um, in particular, one interesting aspect is that when the model is randomized, somehow, somehow, somehow most of these methods, uh, as you will see in the, as you can see in the in the salinity maps, uh, reflect uh, features of the inputs rather than the model. So you can see that there are like the, the shapes of the bird. Uh, so the model sometimes somehow is random, so it does not learn something, but the explanations are telling something about more the input and the the model itself. And this is also something to, to consider and take into account. The second test that they propose is a bit different. Uh, here is just on, on, on the NIST uh, database of numbers. And uh, what they do here is uh, randomize the data labels. So the, they have one model which is trained on the original NIST database. And then they compare the explanations of this first model with the explanations of a second model, which is instead trained over random labels. So as is a, a model that has learned just some uh, wrong and random associations among uh, inputs, images, and, uh, and numbers. And uh, again, also, especially when we take the absolute value of, uh, of, the, of the score, so we don't look at the sign of the maps, uh, in many cases, uh, like integrated gradients as well, or gradient types input, the, the true the maps that we obtain with true labels and with random labels are quite similar. So it seems like that some of these methods are not actually uh, very accurate, but very reliable in terms of the explanations that they are giving us because um, like they don't change, are not very sensitive to the fact that, for instance, in one case we have randomized the model, and in the other case, we have actually randomized the data somehow, somehow the labels of the data. And uh, I think this is very useful at this, but just one of the paper that uh, do these kind of tests, but there are many others that appeared after this one, uh, which try sometimes, somehow to, to find quantitative tests and, uh, and some, somehow benchmark experiments, which we can perform to uh, test the quality uh, of the produced explanations. And the importance of these tests is also that they are showing that in some cases, many of these uh, explanation methods are actually not behaving as we might, uh, as we might expect. Um, but more has been done in this direction. So now uh, what several authors have proposed are different kinds of, uh, of metrics to evaluate some, somehow objectively uh, how good these explanations. It is a bit what I was anticipating at the very beginning of the lesson. Like as we have, uh, if, we, if we remember this plot of uh, accuracy on the y-axis and uh, explainability on the x-axis, accuracy we have, uh, if we specify a data set, for instance, and a model, we and a class of models trained on this data set, we have a formula that uh, we can use to calculate the accuracy, for instance, of a classification. In this case, what has been done by many authors is proposing, suggesting um, in the same way, a quantitative metrics that we can use for um, measuring uh, the performance of an explanation instead. And um, so there, some of them focus on different things. Uh, here I put four of them. The first one I want to discuss is uh, most relevant first out. Uh, what is done here is basically um, taking the scores. So the whatever explanation methods we use, in the end, it produces uh, an ordering of the input features from the most uh, relevant to the least one relevant. And what is done in this, uh, this metric is to use this ordering to gradually remove the features, the input features, either setting them to zero or more sophisticated approaches, and then uh, computing uh, either the ratio of the difference between the function, uh, the output of the function, um, when these important features have been removed with respect to the, the original output. So um, 
again, it's a difference in the, in the error committed by the, by the model. Um, and you take the average over, for instance, the whole test uh, set or, or train set, it depends, and you obtain a, a sort of, um, of measure of how good on average are the explanation. Or better to say, how good was the explanation method in identifying what are actually the, the features that the model has used to make uh, a prediction. Um, the, bot the bottom idea behind many of these methods as well as behind the metrics is uh, some, somehow the same in the sense that the, the, the dimensions and the features which are most relevant should also be the ones that have uh, more impact on the output of the model. So this is the MORPH score. Another score which is uh, somehow similar is the faithfulness. What is done here is calculating the average, again over the test data, for instance, of the correlation between um, the vector of the feature importances directly. So here, uh, phi, as we have already used this symbol in some of the, for instance, in Shapley, is the, is the important score uh, calculated with whatever method you want. And you calculate the, cor the correlation between uh, these, uh, these scores and the difference of between the, the output again and the output when uh, the most important um, features have been canceled, then you gradually remove all these features. So what you have in the end is a vector of, uh, of differences uh, for different kind of degradation of the input. And you measure how much this is correlated with the importance uh, scores. Uh, of course, it should be highly correlated because, uh, again, the, if you remove uh, first the most important features, uh, this should affect more this difference. And uh, it's also uh, the features which are which have the highest score. So when phi is higher, also this difference should be higher. And on the other hand, when phi is, is small, so the feature has a less important is less important, also the difference in the output should be uh, smaller. And so this is what is called faithfulness uh, measure. Um, the other measure is complexity. Uh, complexity is quite interesting because um, what we expect in general, like one of the reasons we um, calculate these explanations is also to understand, uh, okay, what are the relevant uh, dimensions? And these kind of relevant dimensions, we expect that are less than the dimensions of the input. Otherwise, we will just take the whole input and say, okay, this is the whole. There is nothing that can be neglected, or there is nothing that is more or less important than others. So somehow the the, the explanations should also uh, be as coarse as possible, in the sense that uh, should be as much selective as possible. So let's say the input dimension is the whole image. The the explanations usually are underlying and focusing on just some small parts of it. So the complexity uses this kind of uh, of idea by saying that um, the complexity here uh, computed as just the, the, the entropy, if you want, of the explanation should be, um, should be as low as possible. Uh, so the, the, here the, the P, uh, phi, con I are just uh, the, 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 the fraction of, um, of, importance, uh, of the importances and you, got, you take the logarithm of them and multiply again by p, and what you obtain in this way is a measure of the complexity of the, of the explanation itself. And the smaller the complexity, the better should be the, the explanation. And finally, the last uh, um, metric I want to discuss is uh, remove and retrain uh, this ROAR, uh, which is the most, uh, of course, uh, computation from a computational point of view is the most expensive, is the most costly, because what you do in this case um, is calculating again somehow an average uh, difference in the error um, made by the model when you remove some of the feature. But the main difference with respect to other methods like faithfulness or most relevant first out is that in this case, uh, you have to retrain each time the model. So what you do is um, changing the, the input data by removing some of the important features, again, setting them to zero, some other a neutral value, um, and uh, retrain a model on this perturbed database. And what you calculate is then the average test error of, the, of this new model, which has been trained on this uh, um, modified uh, input data. And, um, 
and calculate this average difference in the error. And then you do it again for different kind of different level of degradation of the of the input. And what you can observe, for instance, is the curve of uh, how the how this average error changes uh, when more and more features are uh, are uh, perturbed. Uh, of course, it's very costly uh, because you have to train as many models as uh, the number of features, not the number, the, 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 the number of features that you remove. Ideally, if you remove all of them one by one, you will have to train as many models as the features that you have. Usually, you remove groups of them. So let's say the first uh, important 10 features, uh, for simple star 20, and so forth. Um, why it is done, why it has been proposed as a measure. The, the main critics of the other three metrics, the other, the, not the three, the first two metrics, is that, of course, if we set to zero some of the features, um, we don't know actually if the, the let's say, the, the worsening, the degradation in the output, so the fact that the output is, uh, um, is uh, let's say, uh, is wrong, it's, uh, it's, it's damaged. Uh, we don't know if it is due to the fact that we have uh, actually removed the important feature. So the, let's say the classification score has dropped or uh, due to the fact that we have induced a shift in the, data, in the distribution of the input data. Because of course, setting to zero or changing to some other value, some of the features is inducing um, a change, a perturbation in the distribution of the input data, which we don't have much control on. So we don't know what's exactly the effect of this change into the, into the model. And so possibly what is discussed by uh, in the ROAR paper is that, uh, let's say in MORPH or in the faithfulness, this difference that we observe in the output is not only due to the fact that we have removed some important feature, but it's also due to the fact that we have changed the distribution of the input data so it's not really fair to compare, let's say, the models uh, when we remove some of the features. And so what they'd say, okay, is if we retrain the model, then in the end, we are comparing uh, in a more fair way uh, what happens uh, if actually these dimensions are relevant or not, because the, the possible effect of the distribution shift, shift has been taken into account because the model has been retrained on the new perturbed data. Of course, the problem, uh, the other, the critics that one might move is the fact that um, in the ROAR case, one is comparing different models because the models are being retrained every time. So what we are comparing is, uh, is different kind of models which have been trained on different data. And so the, there's, there is a, also critics that one may do, the fact that in, in the case of ROAR, what is uh, really measuring one is not probably not much uh, how some features are important for a specific model, but how much those features are important in general for a class of models uh, for a specific problem. Anyway, are, these are all very uh, good and valid attempts uh, of defining metrics for evaluating uh, explanations in a, in a non-subjective way, let's say. So in the end, all of them produce a score that we can use to compare different explanation methods on a given uh, trained model. And uh, very, very recently, uh, actually, I think it's in Eurips, uh of this year, of 2022, uh, there is this paper, OpenXAI, uh, towards a transparent evaluation of model, which is also a library, which you can already find um, online, and um, where basically uh, there are some several uh, benchmarks database and several explanation methods uh, which you can use and try on, on this benchmark database and benchmark models. And many of these metrics, some of, of them which I have discussed now, but also others. And so you, you have, let's say, a simple library in Python where you can play and compare uh, different models and different explanations uh, using some of these, uh, of these metrics. And another library, which was also recent, uh, where you can find um, many of these metrics for evaluating explanations is called Quantus. Um, it's, it's, it's another set of, uh, of functions, of, uh, of classes and functions that uh, implement uh, these and other metrics which you can use to um, measure the quality of, uh, of the explanation. Let's move to the last part of the, 
of this um, of this of the theory part of the lesson, uh, which is a bit telling you a bit more about application to of explainability to to earth science. Uh, we have discussed uh, different kind of uh, of methods. Um, I would say that all of them have been used in uh, in different works uh, for application to to earth science and different kind of problems. Um, the main uh, from my point of view, the main difference uh, when we apply explainability, but in general, deep learning to earth science with respect to uh, some other computer vision problems, not, not all of them, is that uh, in some cases, I, uh, we are really interested in, in discovering a new solution or, or to, to a problem that we don't know how to solve otherwise. So the main difference that we have in many cases when we apply uh, machine learning and explainable AI to uh, earth science problem is that we don't really have uh, in mind the solution of the problem itself and we are instead interested to use um, a deep learning solution to help us finding a, a solution to a new problem for instance that we have and so that's why i think in this case uh, explainable ai is particularly relevant because um, understanding how and why the model is making a certain prediction is become is, is even more important than just the score. Let's say we have uh, the MNIST database or the ImageNet database or the CIFAR database, which are these typical benchmark data sets which are used in computer vision. Um, in that case, let's say that we, we, if we have the, the accuracy, that's all. Like we have the measure of accuracy, that's all we need probably. And uh, we are not very interested in understanding, okay, how the model has made a certain prediction. Because in the end, uh, it's also a problem that uh, we can visually solve very easily. In the case of earth science, but science in general, when we apply uh, deep learning methods, in many cases, we don't know the solution. And so using explainable AI can be really a very powerful tool for understanding uh, what are these uh, new features and new patterns that the model might have figured out to solve uh, a problem. And um, let me give you two, uh, two references of two recent uh, reviews, um, one by Elizabeth Burns and collaborators, uh, Explainable Artificial Intelligence in Climate Science and Meteorology. And meteorology. And the other one by uh, Javert, uh, explainable AI for Earth observation. And both of them, um, both of them uh, are a collection of uh, multiple papers and references um, on uh, that have used uh, explainable AI uh, for solving uh, remote sensing or science problems. And this uh, this this cartoon, this picture uh, is taken from the the first paper. And uh, it summarizes somehow what are the three uh, dimensions or three goals of explainable AI. So one, the, the green one, fine tune and optimize, I think has been uh, extensively used already and explored with, with successful results. So as I was saying at the beginning of the talk, uh, we can use explainable AI to find uh, biases in the, in the problem, in the model and in the data uh, and so forth. And so fine-tune our model, change it, change the data, and improve uh, our solution. The other one is to obtain trust. Uh, and this is a bit, is very important as well, but uh, of course there is the, always this limitation of uh, finding confirmation of what we already know in the explanation themselves. But for sure, let's say uh, in some application is, uh, for instance, medical application is relevant to obtain um, to use explainability to obtain some more uh, trust in the model and the third uh, dimension which uh, i mentioned from the very beginning but i also warned you which uh, by saying that i think it's a bit premature and uh, it's very interesting but still uh, probably not so close to achieve not so easy to achieve is learn new science like ideally as i was discussing just a moment ago I, I agree it's very important to use explainability on deep learning models uh, trained on uh, earth science, earth observation problems with the objective of discovering new patterns and new features that we didn't know about a given problem. But of course, it's not that, uh, it's not that easy for, for many reasons. And I hope some of them have become clear with this, uh, with this talk. First, first of all, that we don't know 
are reliable are these explanations. There are multiple explanations which are possible and so forth and so on. Let me nonetheless uh, discuss um, one application which I found interesting uh, and it's also very, very recent. I think it's not been published yet. Um, of explainable AI to a remote sensing problem. So in this paper, um, what they, by Rocher and collaborators, what they wanted to do is to somehow find uh, indications of uh, and features uh, of wilderness with explainable AI. So what they do, what they did was uh, training a model, a UNET, as you can see in the uh, top right, uh, the architecture of a UNET. Um, on Sentinel-2 uh, images uh, taken over uh, uh, the Scandinavian peninsula. And um, basically uh, they had used the, the target was uh, whether the, the picture was uh, artificial or, um, or wild, let's say. It was, uh, was classified as a wilderness or somehow a human slash artificial surface. And this classification was obtained by grouping uh, some of the Greenland colors. So uh, there is uh, this very uh, known and popular uh, classification of, of land use and cover, which is uh, available at European level at very high resolution. And they just uh, made a classification, uh, a binary mask uh, built from that, um, from that, um, uh, from the Greenland color classes. And um, they had modified a bit the UNET architecture by adding uh, at the end of the decoder. Uh, so we have this typical U architecture where you have the encoder and the decoder. And at the end of the decoder, before the classifier, which was uh, the fully connected part, they have uh, one layer which has the same dimension of the input, which is the um, in blue and uh, and yellow colors, which you can find at the at the end of the architectures before the the fully connected part, and for them that was the the layer encoding uh, the 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 features, the, the most important features and the, the the explanations, if you want, in some sense of the uh, of the input image. So what the model has learned to associate with the wild or human related. And so what they did in particular was, uh, as you can see in the second figure, was taking several images. And each of these image has one of these activation map associated, which has exactly the same uh, dimension of the input that is in RGB. And then they just uh, plotted these, uh, all the pixels of these images in, in three dimensions, which is the, the the plot, that you, the surface that you can see with three colors uh, in the RGB uh, scale, and uh, and this was used basically to, to cluster to classify the different uh, the different images into wild or uh, human. How? So what they do was taking uh, was making perturbation of the points in the activation space. So taking this the diff the distance between points in this three D uh, RGB uh, surface. They were perturbing them by canceling some of them or by making occlusion in this uh, final space and seeing how the output was changing. So how sensitive uh, was the classification score to changes in this activation space? And in this way, what, which is what you see in the left uh, plot, uh, they could, uh, let's say, classify and associate different parts of this activation space to uh, wild or human uh, related um, areas. So, for instance, the the, the blue parts are the uh, less sensitive, and then you have the the green uh, parts, which are the most sensitive, uh, the ones that change the most the wild uh, wilderness uh, score of the model. And so, in this case, they have they were they were able to somehow using, in some sense, uh, the technique of occlusion, but in a different way, in occlusion in activation space. They were, they were able to uh, relate uh, the concept, the, the classification of the model with a concept encoded into the, the activation space. Um, the other one I want to discuss is a work I have, uh, I have uh, participated, I worked on with other, uh, many other uh, collaborators uh, 
within um, a project last year, uh, which is about uh, wildfire danger estimation. And also the, the tutorial uh, later will be uh, focusing on, um, on, this, uh, on this data. So uh, what we had in this case, the goal of this problem was to estimate uh, daily uh, fire danger based on a number of uh, weather variables and remote sensing variables like the, the NDVI and surface temperature and so forth. Uh, which are um, believed to be five drivers. To do so, uh, our colleagues have uh, created this uh, huge data cube uh, with X, Y, and time uh, dimension, and then train three different types of model architectures. Uh, so more standard machine learning, like random forest and uh, XGBoost, but then also uh, LSTM, long short-term memory, on time series of, of uh, input data, in particular the weather uh, variables, but also some of the remote sensing uh, could change over the uh, previous days. Um, and so the, the data were aggregated in this uh, time series of 10 days. And then finally, a uh, spatial temporal configuration where also the spatial dimension was considered. And in this case, the model uh, considered was a uh, convolutional STM. And the prediction, so the target was for each, for each uh, pixel, uh, whether it would uh, burn or not in the, the day after, so the, the next day. Um, so as you know, of course, the fire occurrence is influenced by several factors, as I said, vegetation, uh, weather, but also human factors. And all of these variables were uh, included in data cube, which in, in the end contained almost 50 variables, 20 of them, which were used for training. And um, what you see in the bottom is the, the typical, uh, typical measure for the performance of classifiers, which is the, um, the receiver operating characteristic curve, where we have true positive rate versus false positive rate. And we have a very good performance of the deep learning models. So this, uh, again, this is a typical uh, setting where uh, it's good that we have a, a model that performs very well and it can be used uh, uh, even for wildfire management, which is super useful. But at the same time, we would like to understand uh, why in some days the, the danger for, for wildfire was predicted to be higher and in others it was lower. What drivers in general the model is using? We have these 20 variables as input, let's say, but perhaps not all of them are relevant and the model is not using all of them in the same way. And also it's important, uh, as I said, through all the, the presentation to obtain trust and uh, uh, transparency. And so we would like to know, for instance, if the model is using in the correct way information about the temperature, about wind, about the moisture of the, of the soil and so forth. And, uh, and so we applied some, some of the techniques I have uh, discussed before. In particular, these are the plots obtained with uh, Shapley values. So what we see here on the left are the variables, the input variables ranked by the average absolute value of the Shapley over the whole test set data. So this already gives us an idea of what are the most important drivers for wildfire danger prediction according to the model. So we have soil moisture, then relative humidity, NDVI, wind speed, and so forth. It was interesting, for instance, that uh, the most important variables are all related with either vegetation or the status of vegetation or how dry is the atmosphere or the vegetation rather than directly the temperature, which of course is also important. Uh, but let's say this predominance of vegetation uh, related variables was very mm, interesting. And uh, if we, the, the various dots, uh, if we look at more, at more detail at this, at this plot, uh, are the different uh, events, wildfire events in the test data. And uh, the x-axis is the Shapley values. So a positive Shapley values, as I said at the beginning, means that uh, the variable is uh, increasing the fire danger, a negative one is decreasing it. And the colors are given by the values of the normalized feature. So we can also see, as I was saying before, when I talked about Shapley values, this method gives us the possibility to see in which direction each of the variables is impacting the output. So we see, for instance, that uh, if we look at the NDVI, that when the NDVI is very high in red, is also has also a very negative Shapley value. So very healthy and wet vegetation 
is also less likely to burn. On the other hand, when the DI is low, on, and we have that uh, these blue values, uh, the, the blue parts of the dots, has also a positive Shapley value, which means that uh, it's increasing the fried danger. And so forth, we find for other variables, for instance, for the land surface temperature, uh, we have the opposite behavior. So when you have low temperature, as we might expect, the danger is lower, and yet the high temperature corresponds also to higher uh, fire danger risk. Um, on the right, we see a uh, sort of uh, interaction between two different features. The information is the same, so again, the Shapley values. In this case, of wind speed on the x-axis, and the colors are given by another variable, which is rapid humidity. And here also, we can observe an interesting feature, uh, which is that we have more or less two types of, uh, of fires in our data set. Um, the blue dots, which are driven by low relative humidity, uh, so the fact that the, the atmosphere was very dry, uh, but also correspond to cases in which this wind speed was also relatively low. So the, the fire danger was not uh, caused by, was not driven by uh, wind speed values. On the other hand, we have these uh, red dots, these red uh, events, where relative humidity is much higher. So there is principle, not the conditions for fires in terms of humidity, but the wind speed was also very high. So the danger was high due to the fact that there were very strong winds which could favor the, the spread of fires. And uh, we also uh, applied partial dependency plots. And here we see these, uh, the PDPs for uh, four different uh, input variables, uh, land surface temperature, soil moisture, NDBI, and relative humidity. And here again, we can we can see that the fire danger more or less follow um, a behavior that we might expect. So it is uh, it increases with increase of temperature in the first plot. It it decreases when the soil moisture is is very high. So the, the moisture of the of the terrain and the vegetation is high. Also, the fire danger is lower. The NDVI is interesting as well because it has this kind of bell shaped curve where we have that. Um, Medial, medium NDVI, medium low NDVI uh, values correspond to higher danger, while both very low and very high values uh, decrease the danger of fires, which also makes sense from a empirical point, from a physical point of view, if you want. And relative humidity follows a similar behavior, similar trend as soil moisture. And uh, what we looked at as well was uh, in the case of uh, the, the LSTM. So the, the long short-term memory um, neural network that uses the time series as inputs was also looking at how the importances change over the, the days, uh, the input uh, days. Um, and this was very important because even if the, it's true that the time series that we were using were relatively short because it was just 10 days previous to the, the beginning of the fire, so there is not there is some dynamical happening. There's some dynamics happening in there, but we don't are not considering, let's say, long term uh, effect and uh, long term uh, phenomena which might impact uh, the the fact that the fire dangers such as I don't know the presence of droughts or heat waves. Uh, but still, uh, in, even in these uh, few days, there are some variables that have an interesting evolution and the model was somehow able to identify these uh, behaviors and to, to we, we, let's say, discovered that by looking at uh, uh, the, the integrated gradient, the average integrated gradients uh, over the whole test set for the different 10 days for different variables. So what we see here, for instance, is uh, the integrated gradients of wind speed over the 10 days in series. Uh, and we see that uh, it's more or less always very close to zero until the end, uh, the, the, the last day where it, uh, it increases typically. Um, and this means that there is a sort of uh, instantaneous activation that the wind speed is important only uh, the day before or the two days before the, the occurrence of fire, which kind of makes sense because like wind speed uh, probably doesn't matter if there was very uh, a lot of windy weather many days before the, the beginning of the fire. 
On the other hand, like total precipitation, which is another of the input variable, has uh, a more, let's say, linear uh, behavior of the activations over the, the 10 days time series, which is given as input, which is telling us that more or less the, the importance uh, learned by the model is not this is uh, more distributed along the, the whole time series. It's not concentrated at the end or the beginning, which also makes sense because like precipitation values in general, what we can expect is that it might be very important for fires uh, how much has framed over the whole uh, time series and not just uh, one of the days or so the day before and so forth. So there is a more of a sort of cumulative effect that the model was able to uh, identify if we look at the integrated gradients. So um, I want to discuss this example okay, uh, because I think uh, what was interesting about it is the fact that and what, what I think one of the messages that I want to give uh, with this lesson is that we have uh, plenty of methods for explainable AI which are uh, available. And um, there are attempts of comparing them and finding uh, relationships or equivalences even among some of these methods. But uh, in the end, uh, um, the take home message is that there is still not one, let's say, explanation method that we can use and give us the right answer and uh, we can apply it to every situation. Uh, it's more um, a combination of, uh, of, of multiple methods and uh, different explainability techniques which can help us uh, to uh, find insights and understand better what the model has learned. So what we tried to do in the end is this work was to use different uh, multiple methods to uh, and combine them for in different ways and combine the information obtained by uh, these methods to uh, have a better understanding of what the model uh, was focusing on to was using to predict uh, uh, wildfire danger. So let me uh, conclude. Um, I think I've stressed enough that explainable AI is a uh, uh, very new. Uh, research field in the end, I think uh, we could say that uh, it started more or less six, seven years ago. I mean, it depends, but I would say that uh, it has been established as a research field uh, in, no, in, no last, in, no, in no more than, uh, than the past 10 years and is growing very, very rapidly. So the, the, it's very interesting because there is a space for uh, new ideas and, uh, and improvements. Uh, but at the same time, uh, due to many reasons, some of which I've discussed, mainly the fact that deep learning models are very complex to explain, first of all, so it's, uh, it's hard to find uh, one explanation that will always work and will fit uh, all models and problems. And also the fact that it's uh, uh, not so clear, uh, as I uh, said in many points today, uh, what an explanation should be, uh, should be like. Uh, so it depends again on who you ask and uh, what is the user in particular. Um, so for these reasons, there are many methods which have been developed and more which have been proposed. So it is not so easy sometimes to, let's say, um, follow all of them and try to understand how they are related. Nonetheless, there are some reviews and some, um, some papers that try to categorize all these approaches. So, and uh, what I've tried to, to say is also that it's not so always clear uh, how the methods compare among themselves and which one we should prefer and should favor. Um, there are some attempts of unification and categorization of, uh, of the methods which have been proposed in the literature. I mentioned the review by the recent review by Lundberg and uh, my collaborators on. Um, classifying the methods based on uh, on how they perturb and modify the input. Uh, there was also uh, some years uh, ago uh, this paper by Ancona, which I also discussed briefly on uh, looking at all gradient-based methods and comparing uh, all of them. Um, I think it's one of the most interesting developments, as I uh, as I said before, uh, that appeared uh, lately is about uh, benchmark datasets. So benchmark tests and datasets. So the fact that 
um, one way to measure the goodness and the quality of explanation is, of course, relying to uh, relying on experts and uh, using expert knowledge. But uh, first of all, in some cases, this expert knowledge is not available, or experts might not agree on what are the the, the best explanations. And also, there is always this problem of confirmation bias, which should not be neglected. Uh, and so it's important to find objective ways to evaluate the explanations. And uh, as I said, there are some metrics, there are some data sets, there are some standard uh, ways which appear to evaluate methods. Um, yeah, at the same time, I've tried to, to present all the, con the contents in a critical way, uh, stressing that there is still no consens consensus of and general agreement on what explainable AI in the end uh, should be. And also the goals of it are uh, generally clear, but some of them are under debate. And I would say there is uh, no smoking gun, so to say, uh, results from explainable AI in the sense that it has proven to be very, very useful in many contexts and is a very powerful tool that we have. But for all these reasons I have discussed, it's hard to say, okay, that there is this case where explainable AI has somehow solved uh, the situation. I think the most fair um, approach is to combine it with uh, human knowledge and expertise, because in the end, uh, explainable AI is also a tool for for us humans to understand uh, deep learning models. So it cannot uh, be uh, thought as separated from us. And so the, the advances could be made and the way it has to be used is in combination with in the ad domain and expert knowledge. Um, yeah, uh, I think one of the other point is, uh, and the open questions for the future is that once we have these explanations, what, what should we do with them, right? Like what are the actions that they uh, they drive? Um, so if, of course, we are using explanations for debugging the model, then it's clear that some or debugging the model or the possible biases in the data which have been chosen to train the model, uh, it's clear what are the actions that should be taken. So one has to modify the architecture, modify the data, uh, use augmentation and so forth. Um, but let's say that we want to use explainable AI to discover new scientific insights, as, as it has been claimed in, uh, in some papers recently. It's still not clear, I would say, uh, how to how to do it and how to use it. Um, also, in in the papers, the application that I have presented on wildfires, we try to use it in the sense to to increase the knowledge and trust, and that's for sure an established and very useful way of uh, using explainable AI. Uh, but I an open uh, debate and uh, some papers which appeared recently uh, are discussing uh, how and um, which actions should be then followed by uh, certain explanations, let's say. And if we think of uh, scientific discoveries and insights, ideally, one would like to use some of these explanations to uh, understand better a model, uh, not a model, the problem itself, and not just the model, and then uh, take actions which could be um, I mean, for instance, use the same kind of, of, uh, of principles which have been extracted from a model of a given situation and extrapolate them to use it to other, uh, to other similar problems. Let's say we have understood um, a certain principle, I don't know, in the cases we have discussed uh, certain, uh, let's say, patterns associated to wilderness or certain features which are associated to wildfires, those could be used in principle to address uh, different situations and um, related problems. Um, so I think that's something that still has to come and still has to be uh, understood and discussed. So this is all uh, for the, let's say, the theoretical part, the introduction on explainability. Uh, of course, uh, thank you for the attention. And of course, if there are uh, questions, uh, they're all more than than welcome and uh, probably this is the best uh, moment to make them uh, i don't know if there were some already in the previous chat because after maybe i lost them after disconnecting but yeah we don't have any question in the chat box but please uh feel free to ask the questions even there at the end of the presentation. 
before starting uh, the, the practical session. I think we have one. We have one question. You, you need to unmute yourself, Michelle. Can you hear me, Michelle? Yes, yes, yes. So yeah. one, que yeah, one, one question. question is about any possibility um, opposition uh, to research in this field. Um, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, there are many actually. The point is more, I, I think it's important to to know, I don't always ask the, the question, but I, I'm from the environmental field and I think we will be sometimes discriminated in these more competition fields. So yeah, I was about to ask that. So uh, explainability is uh, is used uh, is a, as just as a machine learning and deep learning. In the end, it's a tool which is used uh, across uh, several fields of research. No? So deep learning is used from from medicine to earth observation to remote sensing to physics, uh, my background, and so forth. Uh, the same is true for explainable AI. So of course, explainable AI. Um, is of particular interest in in some fields where there is a this a desire of uh, understanding what the models are learning for different reasons, either for fairness, for trustworthiness, for transparency reason, and so forth. There was actually also regulations at the level of uh, European Union about uh, certifying uh, algorithms uh, and deep learning models uh, based on on their explainability. So. And I think the, the the fields where it's more used are in the environmental field, in particular, which you mentioned, which uh, you you come from. Uh, it's certainly used a lot, and, uh, and environmental again is also by itself a broad research field. But uh, it's certainly one of those um, uh, of those fields of research where it's very important to to understand what are uh, the the causes and the reasons for. Uh, models predictions and I don't think there is uh, any discrimination I, I mean of course uh, uh, it's uh, it's uh, relevant and it's important to have uh, some knowledge in, in, in machine learning coding and uh, um, and explainable AI but uh, the good thing I would say of uh, XAI is that since it is used in different fields it's, and it's uh, in the end the tool that should uh, close the gap between let's say, computer vision scientists and models and experts and scientists that knows uh, about the, the, the specific field, uh, it's important to have people from both sides. So if you are more expert, if you come from the environmental side and you feel are, you are more expert on that, then you can, I think, you can find positions which are across the two uh, things, so environments and explainability uh, because both of them are, are relevant. Like in the end to interpret the explanation, as I said, in many cases with the expert knowledge and so forth. So you will not have problem with that. Let's see if there are other questions. And anyway, try, feel free to reach me uh, later or by mail or or what LinkedIn, whatever. So if you have, want to more concrete and specific things, I can maybe send you materials or links. Um, there was another question, which was about, uh, do you think the main reason for miscalibration of, what is the main reason for miscalibration of machine learning model outcomes? And what is the best technique for calibration? Uh, so uh, what do you mean exactly by calibration? Because I think, uh, I think I don't understand that part. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I mean when uh, we use machine learning to predict event or the probability of this event will happen. So I think the model will be calibrated is the occurrence frequency that we observe it already should be consistent with the predicted uh, occurrence frequency by the model. But sometimes there are miscalibration. Uh, we don't have the same occurrence frequency. Uh, so. I wonder how we can fix this problem. Okay, so you're talking about a specific case where, let's say, the output is uh, some frequency or something that has to be calibrated to some value. Mm -hmm. I think because this some of the 
things that we should consider to decide the reliability of the model. Uh, is this? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's true that on on one sense, uh, on the one hand, explainable AI is mainly used, to, let's say, with the objective of finding the, let's say, what the model has learned. But as I have shown in the, let's say, the, what are the relevant factors, so that where the model is right. But as I have shown from the beginning, like it's usable also for finding what would be possible drawbacks and flaws into the, the model itself. So let's say you have the model that, uh, for some reason, is um, is uh, as you said miscalibrated, so it's predicting a, a wrong frequency, and and you can use that. You can use some of the techniques that we use, and perhaps see that it's not using the the the, the right uh, dimensions or the, the right features or not the right combinations of them. So that could help you to to improve the model. I think it's it and it's in the in the field of uh, among the things that we have discussed in the part of model debugging. So you have. A model that is is making wrong predictions, and you want to understand why that is that is happening. So, in that sense, like uh, having not just a measure of the miscalibration, but also of possible sources of it, could be important to to correct this misbehavior that you are observing. I don't know if that answers the question. Okay, thanks. Is there any other question? Actually, I would like to ask one question to you. Sure. Um, uh, especially, uh, okay, you said that there are two methods, the local and the global methods. So in terms of, especially from the point of remote sensing image analysis, what is the challenges to use the local methods and global? I mean, which one also that is the better one for us, especially if, you can, if you're considering the multimodal in the data? Multimodal? Yeah, multimodality in the data. Like sometimes you're using the SAR with the optical images and yeah, uh, like data fusion. It's complicated. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think in the case of uh, of remote sensing or this kind of data, uh, definitely uh, local explanations are are much better because like uh, it's very the, the kind of in the remote sensing in particular, like this not the, the complicate the complexity is not just the model, but it's also in the data itself. They are high dimensional, both in terms of channels that you have. You mentioned that they are multimodal. So it's not just, let's say, uh, complex architectures that we have to use to, to learn something, but it's also complex input data and information which is contained. Uh, so I think in that case, probably using global method might be a bit too ambitious in the sense that, as I've tried to discuss, they have many limitations in terms of what they can achieve. Uh, in terms of, uh, let's say, uh, accuracy of approximating what the, how the model is behaving, while focusing on single inputs could give us a much better, much more confident results and more detailed, because in many cases, in remote sensing, we are also interested in understanding very detailed information about the images. So also in the, this, the, the um, example that I have discussed, for instance, then, in that paper about this wilderness and so forth features, in the end, there was an attempt of finding global structures, but always acting at the level of single features. So I think uh, one of the trends that is emerging a lot, of course, in the end, is how to uh, go from local to global. And uh, I haven't discussed much about it, but uh, in the end, there are different ways, for instance, by using clustering techniques and so forth, to somehow go from a bunch of local explanations, which potentially are one for all the inputs, and try to summarize them and uh, arrive at some more global conclusions, uh, for instance, by making clustering on the, on the explanations. So that's also an interesting direction. Very good approach. <clears throat> Is there any question? If there is no question, uh, I would like to thank you, Dr. Ronko, for your interesting talk. I think now it's time uh, for the practical session. Yes. Uh, I'd like to start now, or you can uh, give a short break, then we can... Just just five minutes. I will uh, connect also with the other laptop, because I, I have all the coding and stuff on the others. But uh, So I will disconnect just for uh, five minutes, and then connect again. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.
five minutes to get done.
Hi. You can hear me. I will start. Yes, yes, I can hear you. I think yeah, okay, we are okay. okay, good. So let me share the screen. Let me start. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Shall we? Yes, I can I can see your screen now. Okay, you can see my screen. Yeah. Per perfect. So okay, so uh, let's see. We, we have already we have still one hour, so I think you will have the link to the um, both. Uh, I think all the, the the participants have the link to both the, the repository with the um, with the presentation, the slides, but also the the code. So I think the best would be uh, for me to to start from this. Uh, uh, one hour is not super long, but we have some time. So I, it was a bit hard to arrange for all the participants to, let's say, run the code live and uh, interact. But what we can do is uh, something in the middle, which is uh, instead of looking just at the Jupyter notebook, uh, which you all have, and you can download and uh, install the libraries and try when when you have time. What we can try to do now is uh, that we build this notebook again somehow together uh, or I build it again in, in such a way that we can see more or less all the steps uh, what they are for. So I'll start from, 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 from scratch. Uh, the first thing that we, the objective of this uh, tutorial is just uh, a little bit to see how we can uh, produce some explanations for uh, trained models. Um, the problem is the one of uh, interpreting fire danger, uh, which is uh, the one I was discussing at the end of the presentation before. Um, it's in the Jupyter Notebook, it's a Jupyter Lab, but I hope you all uh, have some knowledge of it. And uh, it's all in Python. Um, in Python, there is uh, there are many libraries actually whatever is your favorite explainability methods, the good thing is that most of them have very nice uh, libraries associated. And I'm thinking in particular of Sharply values of line. Uh, you can easily find uh, the, the GitHub repository with the code. And uh, usually there is an easy way to install those packages. But uh, in Python, there is also a very nice uh, library, which is called uh, Captum. Uh, which contains uh, most of the most of the explainability methods that we have uh, discussed today. So, as, as a first thing, let's uh, let's uh, import all the libraries that that we need for the or most of the libraries that we need for the for this uh, tutorial. Uh, so, most libraries are. Sorry, this one. Uh, so most of the libraries that we need for the uh, for the the, the the this tutorial and uh, important. Uh, okay, so the the libraries in particular about explainability uh, that we will use uh, at least some of them are contained into Captum. Uh, Captum uh, dot attribution in particular, which is a sub uh, yeah, a class of the of the Captum package. And here you can find, as you can see, Shapley values. You can find line. You can find different versions of Shapley. You can find the integrated gradients and so forth. Um, so many of the of the methods that we have discussed today, and even more. Like these are just some. Um, so. Okay, so first of all, uh, what we need to do is uh, is somehow to uh, load some trained models. But before doing that, let's see first. Uh, let's let's load the, the data. So let's see what the data is. In this case, uh, these data are available on a, on a cloud, and uh, they can be easily. Uh, loaded in this way as a data cube. Uh, DS is our data that contains um, all the, the training set data. 
over which the models have been trained. Um, I don't know how many of you have already some experience with uh, XRA, which is a, a package uh, which is used to, to open NetCDF uh, files and other uh, georeferenced uh, arrays and matrices. Uh, in this case, uh, the data are uh, patches over, over grids of, uh, of different areas uh, containing several variables. So once you open a data set with this X-ray, you have this X-ray data set, it tells you uh, the three dimensions of the cube, uh, time, X and Y. Uh, and then the, you have here the list of all data variables that are contained in the cube. So we have, for instance, the, the NDVI, we have, uh, um, we have FPAR, the photosynthetic activity, we have the lens surface temperature day and night, and so forth. We have also Corinne Land Cover, we have our target, which is the burn areas, as I was saying before, the, um, the objective of this problem was to predict uh, burn areas over, over Greece uh, to, to calculate the fire danger. Uh, and then we have a uh, meteorological variable from era five. Uh, so temperature, uh, precipitation, wind speed, direction, and so forth. It's not important that we go through all of them. It was just, I was just wanted to show you like with the um, XRA, how it is uh, the object that uh, we, we obtain once we open a database. And, uh, and, and then what we can do uh, is visualize some of the variables in the cube. So for instance, we know that we have the NDVI, uh, we can take, uh, we can easily take the, the, the DS variable, so the data set, and uh, just uh, visualize in a very easy way with a dot plot uh, the map of the NDVI. And this gives uh, the, the time, so 2009, March 6. Um, and here, of course, we can change and just it would give us a different a different uh, day of the of the map of the NDVI, so the 18th of March, and so forth. Um, so this is the the kind of data uh, over which the model have been uh, have been trained. Uh, yeah, we can visualize a series of of, uh, of images, uh, so sequences and so forth. Um, the first thing that we want to do is to load the models. So the models which have been trained, uh, the models have been saved. Uh, here we have some of the some of the features. Uh, so the not all the the not all the fifty how many were there? The not not all the 55, 58 features were used to for the training, but only some of them. And uh, what we can do is uh, uh, here, what we define are the dynamic and the static features, dynamic in the sense that they evolve over the time days, the 10 days and the static are features like, okay, digital elevation and so forth, which are uh, varying in, uh, in the scale of days. And, uh, and just uh, have a classes, which is a final file, which would be useful later on. And, um, what we can do essentially is to uh, load the models. This can be done. We have uh, here there is a folder where we have saved uh, the models. And uh, what we can do is uh, to, to load some of them. So for instance, we can execute this line. Uh, we define a model checkpoint here. We just give, we just give the, the uh, the direction of the of the folder and in the folder for instance we have uh cnn a model and so we can call it cnn checkpoint model checkpoint and uh yeah let's 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 try to load it uh, yeah, ah, okay so the, the direction of the this is not Okay, so now, for instance, uh, I'm still loading it. Yeah, so for instance, if we call model hyperparameters, it tells us uh, what are the 
features which have been used and also um, some of the parameters of the model itself some of the hyper parameters like the learning rate like the the weight decay in this case it was used uh, regularization on the model and so forth and uh, once we have it uh, what we have to do is also to uh, to load this uh, this uh, to assign it to the class, so to, lo to load the model itself. So once we have uh, once we have it, we can uh, let's, let's change let's do like this. Let's call it uh, CNN. So maybe later use different. If we later we load the others, we can. Uh, Uh, we have to assign it first to the to the class so parameter the CMN. Okay, so we load the CNN. Okay, now we have loaded the model. Essentially, what we have to do is once we load the, the hyperparameters of the model, we have to assign it to uh, we have to assign it to the to the class uh, which has been uh, created in the library, and in this way we have our CNN uh, CNN models. And here we can call the eval function, which essentially uh, tells us. Uh, also, what is the architecture of this model? So, in this case, it was a very simple uh, convolutional uh, neural network with just one one block, um, which takes the input channels, the features, and the output channels. This the kernel size, as usual. Uh, there is a dropout, uh, which is applied after the first convolutional. Then there is a fully convolutional layer uh, dropout again, a second fully convolutional, uh, so sorry, fully connected layers, uh, another fully connected layers drop out. And then the final one with the two output features, which are the two classes. So burn or not burn, which are the two uh, the two classes of the model. So it predicts whether a given pixel would burn or not. And um, yeah, so what we can do now is uh, to load, for instance, uh, to uh, what we can try to do is either uh, apply some of the local explanations or some of the global explanations. Let's try first to see uh, what we can uh, do with the with the local ones. So, for instance, here, what we can we can select on the over the queue. So again, this is the the database that we have loaded with XRA, and here uh, in this way, you can select a specific uh x and y so a specific patch uh, at a given time and uh and then we can uh we can load it basically the example and uh we can in we can for instance uh plot it so let's try to do like this um let's take this example and see if we can easily um, okay, we have to also we have to also take the import this function, which is for uh, visualizing the pixels. Seven.
Let me just check one thing. Get the volume source. Okay, let me see. Okay, yes, there is this function. Let's see. I think there is no underscore. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot. Perfect. So, yeah, exactly. So, thanks for whoever said that. And um, yeah, so what we can do in this way is essentially visualize uh, very easily. So, this basically gets. Uh, just a function that given the data cube and given the x, y, and t coordinate, uh, it gives us the possibility to access uh, one of the sample, one patch, basically. And what we can visualize for this patch, for instance, is the, the burn areas. So in this case, we see in, in the yellow for this uh, spatial path, what was the, uh, the area that was, uh, that was burned, then the example if we look at it, uh, it will contain uh, also other the other channels and uh, okay. So the example again is an XLA data set and it contains all the variables. So just as we did for the whole uh, the whole cube, so the whole uh, the whole grease. What we can do for for the single ones is again to to look at uh, at single dimension. So I don't know. We can put like a, a LST or or I can I don't know. We can look at the uh, yes, for instance, LST day one kilometer. So land surface temperature during the day uh, one kilometer, and we can. Uh, to the plot. Okay, and so this is showing us what is the land surface temperature uh, for this specific patch uh, on this day. And, uh, and nothing we have just uh, here, you have the values in, in Kelvin of the temperature and uh, and that was uh, just one of the of the channel of this feature. What we want to do now, ideally, would be to uh, to find. Uh, okay, we can also visualize time series of the values. This is not so important. Um, let's. Okay, this is uh, what we would like to do at this point is uh, defining our input. Uh, we can do it in this way. Um, okay, this one also import. Yeah, okay, so so I mean, this process basically is, is needed because we have to transform the, the X array uh, into a tensor. That uh, we can, which can be ingested into the into the models as an input. So the models will not take directly the XRA, but will take uh, will take a tensor matrix. In this specific case, the models have been uh, have been constructed with uh, with PyTorch, uh, as you've seen. Uh, also, when we have loaded the model with Torch, and so what we would like to do is, uh, I mean, what this function does is basically. Uh, transforming it into an XLA. Um, just uh, okay, there is a function. This one seven. Okay. 
let's put it in this. So it works. Okay, so this one seven is so there was a mismatch in the features that we have defined, and this one. Let's run it again. Okay, I mean, this I have to check later, but okay, let's, let's go on. So let's say once you have uh, loaded the, um, once you have loaded the, this, the, um, the, the input tensor, so you have loaded the, the, the image as a, as a tensor, which can be ingested into the model. What you can do uh, relatively easily is to uh, give this input to the, to the to the model itself just like that and uh what you can calculate is also uh the value of the loss function and uh the the prediction of the model so in this case the the, the model has a last year as just a sigmoid function so when you when you calculate the prediction you can take the the, the logits and the exponential of the logits and what it gives you is a prediction for for fires for this uh, for this um, image for this patch, which is uh, according to the to the CNN, it's zero point six seven, let's say, and uh, these are so it's predicting uh, quite a high probability of a, of a fire over that over that area, and uh, this is just the input of the the dimensions of the input. So we have twenty five by twenty five. Uh, 13 dynamic features, uh, which are in DBI, surface temperature, and so forth, and only five uh, static uh, static layers. And what we can do is plotting some of the channel with uh, overlaid the burn areas. So you have uh, you have it also in the in the notebook I sent you. So what we can see, for instance, is uh, how the the burn area. Uh, where is it with respect to the to the area, and where it is uh, with respect to the values of the different channels? Uh, these are variables which have lower lower resolution, the wind wind directions, and also the temperature of air above two meter, total precipitation, and so forth, because these are at a lower resolution um, with respect to the remote sensing uh, variables, such as the the evaporative respiration and so forth. Um, so uh, okay, so the, the, these are the static features, which are nothing but the digital elevation, uh, the slope, road density, population density, and so forth. Um, so yeah, the first 
uh, I think I wanted to show you was is uh, is Lime. Uh, Lime, there is a, a very nice and easy to use package. So you can just, uh, I mean, here was told at the beginning, you can just go to the Lime package and uh, and this is this is contained in Capton, but you can also find the original package there uh, by the Lime author. Uh, they are both uh, very easy to use. In this case, as I as I was explaining before, what Lime does is doing this uh, a local approximation of the model fitting a lasso uh, regression. Um, what is the problem? So the problem is that. Uh, our input is uh, is this twenty five by twenty five uh, image uh, with uh, a total of uh, how many? So thirteen plus five, so eighteen uh, input channels. So ideally, uh, so the point of line is that uh, we have to tell him uh, what are let's say some super super pixels, some, some uh, aggregated features. That he has to use to fit uh, the linear model. So one possibility, as we do here, is just to create a feature mask, uh, which is just uh, one per channel. So we have 18 channels, and we have uh, a feature mask which is different for each of the of the channel, but is the same spatially. So in this way, in this way, what we are doing is that we are saying to the uh, to line, uh, we'll see later uh, how it is given this argument. We were just saying, okay, use each of the channel as uh, a whole feature. So in this way, uh, it will take, um, so the whole, uh, when, when it fits a regression, it will give uh, a coefficient to each one of the, of the, of the input channels. So each, uh, each uh, uh, X and Y dimension are treated as a single variable, let's say. And then what we can, do with Captum is very easy because we just have to call uh, whatever method we are using. So in this case, it's line. Uh, we have this dot attribute uh, function that we can call, which takes usually the inputs, the input tensor, the 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 target. In this case, is one because uh, the, the the area is actually burned, so there is a burn area, and then we can give this feature mask. In this case, we have uh, feature mask, which is uh, one per channel. And the, the number of samples, if you remember during the presentation, to fit this linear model, uh, it needs the, the line needs to have uh, a number of points uh, which have been sampled around the, in the vicinity of the, of the points of the instance that we want to explain. Uh, and so in this case, we say, okay, just use 500 samples. So it will fit this linear regression over the 500 uh, data points. Uh, okay, but this is not very important as a parameter. And then what we, we, we got, okay, and this attribution already contains the scores. Okay, so what we do here is just visualizing this attribution calculated with line. Uh, what we see here, that line tells us also uh, the negative or the positive. What we are visualizing here are the coefficients of the of, obtained with line. And for instance, we can see that as we can expect, the the surface temperature, okay, both at day and night, but also the air temperature, are uh, are given a very high coefficient, which is also positive. So this is linear local approximation. Uh, near this uh, specific instance is uh, focusing, is giving a positive uh, coefficient to both uh, the temp all the temperatures, which is makes uh, sense, and also the wind, uh, the wind direction. So they are all factors which are pushing to uh, higher fire danger. While on the other hand, uh, we have that the precipitation, for instance, or the NDDI uh, have been assigned a negative coefficient. So they are uh, they are decreasing the I mean they are they are, they are decreasing the, the the score for uh, for a fire in this case um, I mean this the fact of the feature mask in this case is in, is important because we could define a different feature mask for instance we could since we have also x and y dimensions we could decide to use that the model fits treats as a 
for instance, patches the input mean by just different features. So in that case, we could also distinguish between uh, temperature patterns within the same image, for instance, by defining five by five patterns or different kind of aggregation of the features. Um, so yeah, here, what we what we do, I mean, what we will see in the, the notebook is that we can repeat this procedure for the three models that we have, which are, uh, as I explained in the presentation, the convolutional LSTM, the LSTM, and the CNN. And we can compare in this case, uh, what are the differences in line. We can see that there are many. So for instance, if we look at the CNN here, the first variable is the, 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 the air temperature instead of the surface temperature. And uh, okay, in this case, it's more or less similar. Um, what about gradient-based methods? So in particular, three of them, gradients, integrated gradients, and GradCam, which we can use. Um, okay, in this case, uh, again, they are all implemented in, um, in, uh, in, in Captum. Uh, what, what I did here in this case for simplifying uh, and for simplifying the, uh, the code was uh, basically defining uh, configure defining a small, a simple wrapper uh, over this uh, pixel-based methods, so these uh, gradient-based methods. So we can specify in this configuration dictionary the kind of model, the input, uh, and a series of parameters. Okay, the target and so forth, um, and then uh, give it as an argument to this activation maps uh, class, which just has to be fitted and will give us back the activation, so the attributions uh, in grad and the loss. But we can actually see uh, inside here, in, uh, in methods, pixel activation, so it's actually a very simple class. Uh, so this class, which I have defined it here, activation maps, uh, um, takes these parameters, which is this configuration file. And then what we have, okay, this part are not important. When we, this fit, um, method is doing nothing but call is just calling different kind of uh, captum uh, classes so if we call gradient is just call, calling the captum class saliency so the method here saliency is is a synonym for uh, gradients so the attribution is calculated using gradients and then as i said before the function is always the same so the, you have to call this dot attribute uh, function and it takes as input uh, the input image and the target in the most simple case. Then you can call the integrated gradients. Uh, and again, there is another class which is integrated gradients and the method to, to obtain the attribution is just uh, by calling this dot attribute uh, over the, the class. And then there are other methods like GradCam and so forth, which you can use. So in this case, to simplify and use different methods, I just put everything inside uh, this function in such a way that you then, for each of these methods that you specify in the configuration file, uh, dictionary, you can put it also in a file, uh, then you get um, as a return the attribution function and okay, also the value of the, of the loss uh, obtained by the model. Then there is also a function to plot the different uh, the different attribution, but it's not very important. So what we do here is to compute the, the gradients. The gradient activation is what is shown here now. So um, since in the gradients, as we have seen in the, in the presentation, what we do is calculating the gradients of the, of the output with respect to the input. Um, what we have in the end is a, is a matrix which has the same dimension of the input variable. So we will have an activation map, which has uh, X and Y and all the channels that we have as an input. So we have a silency for, for the F bar, for the photosynthetic activity. We have a uh, silency for the leaf area index for surface temperature and so forth. And here it's already interesting here, what I've plotted is also the burn area on top not always can be seen very well, but it's interesting in some cases that for, this is quite evident in the case of uh, surface temperature at night, 
that where the gradient is focusing, so where the model is focusing, it's also where we have the burn area somehow. So this is an interesting characteristic, interesting property. Also, for instance, in the case of uh, the wind directions, uh, we see that there is an overlay between uh, the yellow pixels, which are the most active according to gradients, and the the location of the burn area. So it's like the model is more or less focusing in on the right part of the image where we actually have the burn area. Even if we just ask him to classify between zero and one, so we it's not a segmentation task. It doesn't know about uh, the fact that in this specific part there is a burn area. And what we can do is of course computing the same for for uh, for others. And uh, and yeah, what I did in this case was computing the average uh, gradients per day, as explained in the presentation. We give this time series as inputs. And so uh, it's, it's nice, it's interesting also to see how the, the time component and how the, the gradients or the activations of the model evolve over the, over the time. In this case, we, have, we can see that in many variables, we have this growth of the activation over the time series. In other cases, we don't. Uh, and also the scale, of course, is important because in the end, the higher the scale, the higher the values of the gradients, the more important it is. Uh, the same is done for the, the convolutional neural network. Uh, here in this case, we can see that the gradients are much more noisy with respect to the other uh, to the other model, which is the was the convolutional neural uh, LSTM. So we have even that, for instance, in this this is uh, interesting to discuss because uh, it's one of those cases uh, a bit similar to. You know the the wolf and husky case I have discussed in the theoretical presentation, where we see that there are a lot of active uh, patches uh, according to this uh, model, where we don't have anything because actually in this bottom part the the era five variable are have nums basically, so they they don't have values in this part, and uh, this actually kind of C or something. So it's it's somehow focusing on on the wrong parts in some cases, and uh, the same thing can be done with the LSTM. But the LSTM, of course, we don't have the x and y dimension. So what we have is direct is only activations per day for the different days and per channel, of course, uh, always because the gradients in the end follow the same dimension of the of the input data, and. Um, here in this case, then you can compare between the different activations of the obtaining with the three different models. But another thing that can be done is uh, to use a different method, of course. Uh, and instead of gradients, we can call, uh, we can give uh, as argument to the method integrated gradients. Uh, so in the activation maps here, in this class, it will calculate uh, integrated gradients here. And uh, and then we can see uh, what happens. So what what is the what do we obtain? So here is still with the convolutional LSTM, and we can compare again. It's uh, it's showing also the burn area on top, and um, and yeah. So that, there's a, there's this nice property that we see again that the burn area, the for instance in the land surface temperature at night, the active pixels more or less uh, concentrate over the, the burn area. So it's, uh, it seems that has learned some uh, relevant patterns uh, and also for wind speed, for instance, in some cases. Others make less sense, like this one where there are a lot of active pixels where we don't have values, because these are all, all nuts and so forth. And then one can compare again, the temporal behavior by looking at the evolutions of activations over the, the days. Um, the same is done again for the different models. Uh, but a part I wanted to discuss instead is uh, where we uh, try a different kind of method, which is GRADCAM. In this case, as I explained during the, in the slides, you have to decide uh, a, a specific block over which you are applying the GRADCAM. In this case, we, we have decided to apply to the first convolutional block of the model. Uh, 
So the, the how to do it in the end is simple because uh, Captain does it for yourself in the sense that uh, if you here specify grad cam, here layer grad cam, it will just take as a parameter the layer that you decide to give. So you don't have to worry about how to, to handle that like it's already done. And, uh, and what this shows you in this case is, uh, is the result, is the activation maps calculated with GradCam, which is just one, of course, it's just one for all the channels, because uh, if you remember during the, the presentation, uh, in the case of GradCam, what you do is taking uh, the derivatives of the function with respect to the activations of the, of the network itself, so not of the input. And then you summarize them by uh, by summing them. So you you sum over these uh, the different uh, feature maps, and you end up with this weighted uh, weighted sum of the of the gradients of the activations themselves. And so you have just let's say one explanation for all uh, for all the the inputs of the model. And uh, in this case, I think the interesting thing was to notice again that this part was uh, underlined a lot by GradCam. What we, what I did here was uh, basically computing the, the correlation between uh, GradCam itself, uh, this map, and uh, the, the various inputs. So to see which one of the channels is most aligned with these uh, activation maps, which somehow that's an, is an indication of, is a measure, some, some, in some sense of the relevance of the channels, of each channel in giving these particular uh, patterns that the model has learned. And we can see that, for instance, I don't know, the NDDI is highly correlated with it, uh, or, or uh, we have anti-correlation with the total precipitation and so forth. So there are some interesting things there as well. And you can also calculate the correlations between gradient and grad camp. So gradient, again, you have one gradient per each of the channels. And GradCam, you have just, just one, this, this map that you that you have shown you. In this case, so you can see somehow how different kind of importances, if different kind of activations are, uh, are, co are connected among them. So in this specific case, we can see, for instance, that GradCam is very highly correlated with the uh, 0.5. Uh, it's quite also with the NDVI, but also with the surface uh, temperature at night. So some, somehow the, the activations calculated by gradient uh, for this channel are also uh, connected with the activations obtained with GradCam. Um, one last thing I wanted to show is, uh, is the end of the notebook where we use this library Quantus. Uh, here there is the link uh, to the GitHub repository, uh, where there is some tutorial. Uh, there is also, of course, the procedure to install it. And uh, so one thing that we get when we import Quantus, Quantus, as I said before, is a, a package for um, evaluating uh, different explanation uh, methods. So what we can see is called uh, what we can do is, is called quantus.available metrics. And here it tells you just all the metrics which are, uh, which have been, uh, which are implemented in this package. So there is faithfulness, which we discussed before, if you remember, was uh, this average correlation between the activate, so the, the feature importances and the um, error in the model when we remove those important features. Uh, and then there are many other, there is complexity. Each of them is also has also some variation. So there is a uh, effective complexity, complexity, sparseness. Uh, as I said before, there are many um, variations of, uh, of, of the metrics as well, which might depend on how we eliminate uh, the features. Uh, the pixels uh, whenever we have to do some kind of perturbation of the inputs. And uh, so here in this case, I just apply the simple faithfulness correlation, the one that I've um, 
uh, we have seen in the slides. And uh, we applied to uh, the to this specific input and to the to the gradient of the CNN. So in the case of the CNN, so we have to give we have to give to this matrix, of course, the activations, the, the, the feature importances, if you want, or the saliency map, however you want to call it, and uh, the, the input. Because if you remember what you have to do, and the, and the model as well, of course. So we have to give the model, the inputs, the target, and the activations. In this way, what it will do uh, will be calculating the correlations between these activations and uh, the output of the model when we perturb this input and we'll do an average. Uh, so you have to specify also a number of runs because it depends how many times, uh, how many iterations it has to do. Uh, for instance, how many pixels has to answer and so forth. And here we find a very low faithfulness score. So it seems that in the case of uh, the CNN, the gradients, which has calculated on average, have a uh, low faithfulness, which means that uh, there is a low correlation between uh, the score of importances and uh, the output, uh, how the output of the CNN change when we make perturbations. We can do the same with the integrated gradients for the same model. So we are comparing two different activations, integrated gradients and uh, gradients. And in this case, we obtain a, a, a much higher uh, faithfulness score. So in this case, it's uh, 0 0.76, uh, which means that uh, according to this metric, the faithfulness correlation, uh, we have a much better explanation given by integrated gradients rather than uh, simple uh, gradients in this case. Um, so this was just a very a very simple example of how can then use one use this matrix uh, to compare uh, different models. I mean ideally one would like to there is also a way to put all these metrics at once or, or most of them and then I have a sort of full report of how well uh, the model is uh, is uh, how well the explanations are explaining the the input at the moment. Um, I think I think we can conclude here. We can finish here. Um, I don't know if there is some specific question. I'm sorry if there is something that went wrong with the uh, the library, but then there wasn't much time, so I prefer to finish the notebook and show you what is uh, what is explaining what is done there then you can always uh, reach me and text me if you try uh, the notebook yourself and if you have problems in installing some libraries or, or uh, in uh, running some parts of the code you can just uh, ask me directly and i will help you of course uh, in fixing uh, whatever problems you might find um, but I think it was uh, interesting to give you a sort of uh, brief explanations of uh, what is done and showing you that it's very simple to, to use uh, libraries like Captum, but there are also others actually that you can easily uh, give uh, to these functions like uh, trained models and inputs and get very easily many of the uh, feature importances and, and activation maps that we have uh, seen during the lesson. So I mean, my invite is just to play a bit with the, with the notebook and or even directly uh, start with the Captum tutorials or uh, tutorials for the metrics if you're interested in the evaluation of, uh, of um, activation maps and uh, try that or whatever problem you want to, you are interested in or, or data sets you are working with, uh, because they are very, very easy and friendly to, to use. So don't hesitate to, to reach me after the, the lesson for whatever problem you may have. And uh, thanks for, for, for the attention.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ranko. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if there is no question, as Dr. Ranko also mentioned, you can ask uh, your questions to directly send uh, him an email. And, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. It actually has been a quite uh, beneficial uh, lecture for the ones who would like to want to do a research on explainable AI. So I would like to also thank the all the participants for their attending, the attending the, the school. Okay, before closing the session, I would like to remind you that uh, we will have our last session uh, in the tomorrow morning about the pulsar, which will be given by Dr. Ivik Patacharya and Alejandro Frey. Please note that tomorrow we will uh, start uh, one hour earlier than usual at nine. Uh, with respect to the UTC class two uh, time zone. So with that, I think um, that's all. So again, thank you very much for accepting the invitation and for all thank of you. your contribution. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.